I've just done something so stupid for the past hour that I need to tell someone about it. So here goes. I noticed recently when I was trying to record a sponsorship ad that the audio was abysmal and I thought my microphone's really good and normally I don't need to mess around with the audio in post because I hate doing that. I like things to just work. It's very irritating for me when they don't. I actually used to work in tech and nothing seems to make me more annoyed is a bigger pet peeve than when tech doesn't work. When a computer has a simple task to do and it ain't doing it, it infuriates me. So I have a very short temper for these types of things. It's just annoying, right? So I go to film this current video and I test the microphone out beforehand and the same issue where usually it's clear and doesn't need much doctoring. It's all echoey and weird and muffled and sounds horrible. And for the advert, I tried. I got one of my friends who's an audio engineer to try to do what he could with the audio and it still sounded terrible. So I'm fuming, right? Because I... I'm not gonna have to, I'm not gonna sit here and listen to subpar audio. I need this to be the best it possibly can be. That's in my control. So I test around and it's still crap. So I contact Amazon because uh, yeah, I gave Jeff Bezos money. I ordered through Amazon. It's just more convenient. All right, I'm sorry. I know I'm part of the problem. Contact Amazon. Oh, it's out of the 30 day return. So you cut and I was like, what? So I'm already, I'm getting a little bit annoyed. Speak to an advisor and they were like, oh, it should have a warranty with the actual company. You need to speak to the actual company. Hmm, yeah, that makes sense. So I emailed the company. The company requires a serial number. My invoice has no serial number. Thanks, a brilliant, good one. Doesn't matter. I emailed the company anyway to complain about this issue and how it's just, I find this this audio, if I can't fix it in post and some of my much more advanced friends can't fix it and make it sound good in post, then I can't, I can't work. I can't knowingly and will, it kills me to have to put stuff out. That's a bit crap. Even though I, I do think my content is a little bit crap. I don't think my content's very good, but I try to make all of this, you know, like I have an autofocus issue with this lens and it kills me. It's so annoying. That's why, that is why I changed from being in front of my bookcase to being here. Cause I thought it was, it was trying to focus things. There was too much going on in the background and I ain't gonna use manual focus, right? This whole rant means nothing to anyone who doesn't care about this stuff. I don't like using manual focus because you can't like the, the viewfinder's this big. If it's a little bit fuzzy, a little bit out of focus even, correct terminology, you can't really tell until it's filmed. And these videos I film are long. So if all of them are out of focus for the entire, for the whole, what? Do you know what I mean? That's why I'm over here now instead of over there. Cause I thought, no, it's just my lens is a bit crap. So now I'm gonna have to save up and get a secondhand lens. Cause lenses, they're all like a, they're like a grand brand new or 600 pounds second. What? For a little bit of, I have no idea how a lens, but I don't, to be honest, I don't even know how this is capturing and recording me right now. I do kind of think it's witchcraft or magic. I don't get it. And people can explain about it catching the light. I don't get it. So anyway, this email, I'm so bold. Not really, I'm still polite, I'm still polite. The quality is echoey and strangely muffled and impossible to edit to the same standard the quality was originally because the quality is great by itself. I did not change the settings of of the hardware or my recording software, the quality diminished randomly by itself. How could this possibly have happened? I'd like to know whether it can be fixed or replaced under warranty, which is which is fair enough, right? Fair enough, except I use Audacity to record on. Turns out where it says microphone, I'd put it on or it had reverted back to the standard of use the built-in microphone the laptop has. <laughs> not the microphone that this thing is attached to. The reason it was so bad, and I have to redo that advert regardless because apparently it just wasn't up to scratch. The reason it was so bad is it was using my shitty laptop mic. I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed because I, I'm just embarrassed, all right. I guess my brain just did that thing where you just you just skim over, you assume everything. I don't actually know why it reverted back to that. 
whatever. I'm stupid and I actually sent a follow-up email. They're not going to check their emails for like three days apparently, but I sent a follow-up email to say, disregard this email. I'm stupid. I fixed it. Sorry, I've wasted your time reading this. So anyway, welcome to today's video. So for today's video, we're going to look at Jim Chapman's book. Yes, that's right. Jim Chapman, the former husband of not Tanya Mojo, because that's not her name. Tanya... Tanya Burr, no, no, Tanya Burr. I kid you not, if you go onto Google Images and look up Jim Chapman, all you will see is him making this exact same face because, because he's a model, guys, you know. This is his smoldering, I am a model, and this is my model look face. <laughs> Seriously, go look. Like, we're off to a fantastic start already, I can see. I can see clearly now that my microphone is working. So, so embarrassing. I find that stuff embarrassing because my, my best mate, Callum, who's who's now on my podcast with me as well, he's an audio en engineer. So I'm like messaging him and I'm just getting angry at the sound of my own typing, just like, fucking microphones never work and the technology sucks and why can't anything just... It turns out I can't do my job. I messaged Kes Motion, who's on his way to a date, just being like, ah, oh, this is my... Girl. And they were... They were the thing is, is they were all stumped as well. They were stumped because they didn't think I'd be that stupid, no doubt. Why is this in dark mode? Oh, whatever. Do you know what? Let's just get on with it. We're looking at Jim Chapman's book. Jim Chapman was originally a vlogger in the UK type vlog squad with Zoella, Tanya Burt, Naomi Smart, Marcus Butler, Alfie Days. Ringing any bells here? Yes, one of those. So he's done something a bit different. It's a kind of semi-autobiographical, semi-factual book. Well, you'd assume that autobiographies are inherently factual. It's it's like a it's it's a Jim Chapman's guide to life. 147 things. The best guide to life book that I've ever read, not written, because I don't do that, was Bart Simpson's Guide to Life. And I will die on that hill. That's an incredible book. Do you know what? Do you, do you know what? I saw this Reddit thread the other day about what can you not prove, but you know of in your bones to be true. And someone said about how they wrote an episode of Doctor Who to send in. There was a competition going on. Children, send in some plots to Doctor Who. We'll pick the best one, la la la. They sent in this this whole little outline plot script of a Doctor Who episode. It got sent back because of formatting issues. And what do you know, like a year or so later, that exact same episode was put up, but with the Daleks instead of like, I oh, know, I don't watch Doctor Who, right? And they are so sure that the competition was just to get ideas and they ripped off this idea. I once saw a competition on CBBC, the children's BBC, and the competition was inventing your own imaginary pet right and i considered doing it or well, maybe i did do it and send it in i don't know but when they announced the winner the winner of this competition had used like basically traced the imaginary pet in bart simpson's guide to life because he has this ultimate pet and it's got loads of horns and wings and it's 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 like this amalgamation of loads of stuff that a 10 year old would find cool it's incredibly distinctive incredibly unique and this competition winner had definitely traced or just copied this and they won something cool for cheating never live life honestly that's when i knew being honest just doesn't actually pay off always do what you can to get ahead in the rat race of life i'm in a fighting mood with myself i've been so stupid for this microphone issue so i've reviewed this book because i'm just really intrigued as to what jim chapman has to say about black holes also but before we get into that, today's video is sponsored by Scentbird. Do you like smelling good? Who doesn't? Am I right? But sometimes there's just so much to choose from when it comes to fragrances that my poor little puny brain can't handle all the choice. That is where Scentbird comes into it. Scentbird is a place for you to begin or deepen your relationship with fragrances, to find out what you like, what turns you on, what makes you tick, to discover your style or just build your collection. Scentbird is a place for you to express your individuality through the power of fragrance. Scentbird lets you try out a new designer fragrance, just test it, see if you like it for $17 every month. Every month you will pick what you want to receive so there's no surprises. They have perfumes, colognes and unisex options. 
With each fragrance, you will get a 30 day supply of mini vials. So you can try them out before committing to a full size bottle. Because some of those full size bottles cost a lot. They can cost between 150 to 300 to 500 dollars. All you need to do to discover new fragrances is to take a quiz on Scentbird. Based upon your preferences, previous purchases, and quiz answers, they'll help you find the fragrance that you love. Scentbird carries Prada, Gucci, Versace, and niche brands like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel. So what are you waiting for? Use my special promo code, Elise, to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. That makes it just a little over $7 for your first month. Available in the USA and Canada. Thank you, Scentbird, for sponsoring today's video. Check out the links below, and then let's get on with it. Also remember to like, comment, dislike, subscribe, resubscribe if you've been unsubscribed. I keep forgetting to say this, but whenever I do say it, the engagement rating is really good. So please, can you do that for me? Cheers, mate. Maybe I'm cynical. But there's something about Jim Chapman I just don't really vibe with. I'm not his target audience because I'm not a teenager. So there's that, I suppose. But I've always found his, hi, best friends. You know, like being in your late 20s and saying, hi, best friends, to a bunch of teenagers, probably predominantly female. I always found that very insincere. There's also extra context that's useful to understand. So when, say, the Brit Vlog Squad, for example, when these guys were doing YouTube videos, it wasn't really a cool thing to be doing YouTube videos. So they were among some of the first to do it and do it successfully because the market was so different back then. It was so unsaturated with people because it just wasn't something that a lot of people did. So some of these people became really, really, really successful for doing things like, I don't know, the chubby bunny, bunny video or what's in my bag or uh, as the shopping haul or whatever. They became phenomenally successful. Traditional media starts to pay attention, starts to invite them to movie premieres, etc., etc. Slowly over time, it becomes this cool thing, and now it's the beast that we see it as today with TikTok stars, etc., etc. TikTok stars now being the new. Kudos to them for getting so successful and some of it staying. However, I think that the success early on made a lot of these individuals, inc looking at you, Alfie Days, incredibly smug with an overestimation of how much talent they really have. Having talent is one thing that's all well and good. It means nothing without discipline and a hard working ethic. Absolutely, you can't get far on talent alone. And when your content was every single Sunday doing some variation of, here's my everyday makeup routine, here's what's in my bag, here's what's in my Tesco shopping, here's a clothes try on haul once a week, that, <laughs> not the shit, like some people do that type of content and I don't mind it, I think it's all right. Like Emma Chamberlain's done a bunch of that, but she's also got quite naturally funny. I do love Emma Chamberlain to be fair. But when these people only had to do that once a week and they were getting millions of views, and they became successful very young, it's not the same type of work ethic that one has to have with YouTube today unless you're incredibly lucky and blessed by the algorithm. Because nowadays with social media, you kind of have to be grinding and you have to be making sure that your, your videos are of a certain quality because guess what? There are now thousands of other people on these same platforms doing similar to you and doing better if you do not work harder. Do you know what I mean? Do you see where I'm going? So much so that a lot of them, Tanya Burr, seem to think that they, and, and Jim Chapman with his screenwriting, right? Seem to think that they could just waltz into other industries and careers because so far they, you know, for what, 10 years, they had everything handed to them. You want to go on BBC Radio 1, Alfie Days, to talk about this? You want to interview One Direction? So, la, 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 la. They had these things handed to them because they were popular, not, you know, because they had a big following, not because they were really good at presenting or really good at being on the radio. So some of these people thought they could just waltz over to other industries and it would be fine. And they found a big slap in the face that hasn't. One of the only people I've seen who's managed to transgress that line successfully has been Joe Sugg. And I think he's all right. It's a fair play to him. But these others, I do think most of them are incredibly smug, very entitled, with an overinflated ego. And I think that comes across. If you if you know how to look for it, I think it comes across. And there is a narrative. Look, I'm the first to make fun of Tanya Burr. I love it. I'm just, I'm such a bitch. But there's this narrative 
that seems to have formed that he's just this really 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 nice guy that's never done anything wrong and she's treated him xyz and blah 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 and it's a narrative i don't agree with because i do think it's slightly misogynistic oh, of course the woman's the problem you know and i know the law about these people partly because i have actually been <laughs> compiling notes to write a satirical book about influencers one day so it is part of the job description bigger part of it is i do secretly love gossip even if i won't engage in drama and gossip anymore because it's not good to be putting out there internally i'm a hypocrite and i do like reading up gossip about some people because it is kind of interesting i just think this narrative that she was entirely the problem is a little sexist and wrong in fact on my third channel i did a video about his his new house tour personally i find him very snipey very passive aggressive and very put downy and it comes up a few times a few times in this put downy in a way that maybe from the outside it might be quite funny but if you're on the inside of that and it's constantly happening it happened in their vlogs you know he acted like she was a five she is and tanya was a five-year-old most of the time, but the vlogs are all deleted now because Tanya Burns destroyed her channel. I think there's just this inappropriate, like kind of creepy side to Jim that, for example, when he and Tanya Burr were married, he was just constantly patronizing her. If he and Zoella were together, they were basically flirting. And I remember seeing this one clip once of, I don't know who went, it was just like one of their woman mates went round to their their house to do something. Maybe it was an assistant, I don't know. Maybe it was assistant, who knows? It was just a random woman who was a friend of theirs. And Jim was like, oh, oh, oh I'll get the condoms then. Where, where's the joke? What's the joke? What, she's a female and you're a bloke. So you should have a shag, even though you're married. Is that the joke? With that level of humor, mate, you should be going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I think you'll do so well up there. Just, just a bit in a pre and everyone just kind of like laughed awkwardly, like ha ha ha. Because how is that even funny? Ooh, I'll get the condoms then, <laughs> female. <laughs> Shut up. I saw another clip once of it was one of their house parties, and he was like humping the air behind one of their female mates' heads. I don't know about you guys, but I would not be putting up with that behavior if I was married to someone. Imagine Tanya Bird doing that, do you know what I mean? <laughs> It'd be too much for Jim's fragile little ego. He'd probably have a right, um, it's just it, behaviors like this. I just think he's a nice guy, TM, and I don't buy it. You know, him and Zoella would be a little bit put downy of Tanya Burr, like she was meant to be the dumb and stupid one of the group. She's gone through this massive public personality change. Maybe that, the, I'm just trying to be a cool girl, I don't care about anything, aesthetic. Maybe that always kind of was Tanya's real personality. Cause she's a smoker and you wouldn't think that, I don't give a shit if someone's a smoker. I'm on day four of giving up vaping. It's so hard. It's taken all of my willpower and having technological issues has not helped with that. Maybe that's why I'm so angry. But you won't think that from the cookie cutter, oh, just bake cakes for me, I'm so happy. So maybe she got fed up of being the dumb and ditzy one of the group. Who knows? I think they all got given these little characters to play by Gleam, the... I've been recording for 15 minutes. I've not even got to the content yet. I'm just going to crack on with it and I'll just, I'll just try and prove my point. Since the dawn of time, there have been many important questions. Are we alone in the universe? Is there anything after death? What is the meaning of life? Which dinosaur had the biggest penis? I can answer the first one. No, the Pentagon admitted that they have a UFO, a UFO from another planet. You'd know this too if you bothered to read the news or watch Ancient Aliens. Does, does no one care that the Pentagon did say this a year ago? Did I imagine this? Did I dream this? Was it a fever dream? Why does no one... They, they, they came out and said it. So what's all this rubbish about? Dogs can hear me. I'm going too high pitched, pitched anyway. Want to know whether the chicken or the egg came first? I'm your guy. You most certainly are not. Interested in how far back in time you could go to kidnap a baby that would be able to deal with 21st century life? Well, babies naturally adapt to their environment, so I assume all of them would be fine. My wife, Tanya, bears the brunt of most of this as I come running into a room brandishing a fact like an excitable child who wants to show you his new toy but won't actually let you touch it. Don't age well, did it? If she's not available, I'll tell the nearest thing with ears, usually my dog Martha. This part really didn't age well, did it? Where's Martha, Jim? Shall I tell you the mystery? 
because I did a little bit of research two days ago. Samantha, Jim's sister, went on a gossip forum. Pretty sure it's her because she also messaged someone back on Instagram saying, yeah, it's her. She was just fed up with speculation, something to do with her own life and finances, whatever. And so people got excited by this. And naturally, the first thing people commented back was, where's Martha? What happened to her? And she said something along the lines of, not her story to tell, Martha is alive and happy, rehomed, living with another sausage dog. That is the, and that happened last week. That is the mystery finally solved. Why neither of them just came out and said it? On one hand, I do think that a lot of stuff isn't our business or my business. So I could understand not wanting to. On the other hand, when you, you, you've you made this public spectacle of having this pet, the pet is featured in a lot of your content. You've put the pet on Instagram a lot, updates, this kind of thing. Martha's mentioned a lot in this. It would be natural for people to question, well, why is the dog suddenly disappeared? Because they were trying, after the divorce, they were trying to co-parent this dog for a little bit and then the dog just disappeared. It would be natural to ask questions about that. But if the dog was simply alive and well this whole time, why have neither of them said that? Maybe they would get a bit of flack for rehoming this dog that they've had for several years. They probably would, okay? She's a sausage dog. Not exactly high maintenance. Try having a big dog that needs walking an hour, an hour and a half a day. A little sausage dog. 30 minute walk around the block. Tired out. Done. Um, yeah, not exactly that high maintenance. But I would rather get flack for rehoming a dog. At least the dog is happy, having a nice, healthy life somewhere. I'd rather have that than constantly have to block comments calling me a dog killer. Because that's what people assumed. People just assumed that something of that nature and caliber had happened. I'd rather be known as someone who was being a bit irresponsible than someone who ended an animal's life. But that's just me. And for a moment, I'll feel very smug, safe in the knowledge that I am, without a doubt, the smartest human to have ever existed. I can't even be mad at this considering this is exactly how I live my everyday life. Every day I discover something that makes me either feel minuscule or so overwhelmingly rare that I struggle to comprehend it. And both of those feelings excite me. If only any of it humbled you too. I started this script months ago and I kept getting fed up of it. I haven't gone back to edit it. So I've got a bit saying, maybe explain why you find Jim really smug. Thank you past me. Thanks. <laughs> The using, his ex, the using his current wife to attack his ex-wife but pretends to be above it all, he does do this, right? Because the current wife got fed up of the hate from Tanya's fans even though they weren't, they weren't signing off. I'm Tanya's fan and I hate you. It's not nice to... Oh God, this is a whole conversation that could go on for about 20 minutes but I've got this whole video to do. Okay, when you're an influencer, no, it's not on to get hate. It is gonna happen though. And when you're of a certain degree or caliber, when you have a certain number of, of people following you. I think it's just so mentally healthy to switch off from it all. Do not read the comments. If it bothers you that much. I mean, these people are also getting like dozens of really positive comments and then maybe once in a while a really negative comment. Yeah, so, but you tend to remember them all. Negative ones, sure, I get that. Either, if it bothers you that much though, the idea. And mess I don't know why these people have their message requests open. You can turn your message requests off. Do that. Don't give people the opportunity to send you nonsense. Either don't read it or turn your message requests off. Change your comments to only people you follow or whatnot, or just ignore it. But the new wife got some comments about being a home wrecker, which just is inaccurate. They met after the divorce. Well, after the split up or whatever. The new wife decided to then reveal personal information about Tanya and Jim's marriage, i.e that the marriage ended because of infidelity, but not on Jim's part. This was not, and then, so the hypocrisy in, I'm getting hate and I think it's from Tanya Burr's fans, even though she doesn't acknowledge mine or Jim's existence anymore. Hmm, doesn't make sense. So I'm going to turn the tide on her and have, and she got, Tanya Burr got so much hate being called a cheater and a X, Y, Z, like she got so much. So there is hypocrisy inherently in that. Cause she didn't say, don't send her hate. She just said, oh yeah, Tanya's the one that cheated. And no one stopped to think about what that actually means because the new wife is only getting information from Jim. Jim was in the relationship and thus is an unreliable narrator and is very biased. Jim likes to imagine that the women in his life are all obsessed with him 
And anything less than this is a bit of a blow to his ego. And you can see this in interviews where he's talked about said, even in the, he did an interview with Stephen Bartlett, Diary of a CEO, and they were talking about love and life. And Jim is always the one to make snipey remarks about Tanya. Tanya has just risen above it all and pretended that these two don't exist. On the Diary of the CEO interview saying, basically about how like Sarah was really obsessed with him, but like, under the guise of being super supportive, but just the way, I don't know, the way he says it, man, the way he says it. Tanya was obsessed with him when they were together. Now now the new wife is. And can I just say super quickly, I got something wrong a little bit. So they announced their split up and then I looked this up recently because it was in the Daily Mail. A few weeks, like literally a month or so later, Jim was seen out with um, who is the person who is now his new wife, right? When they did go official with their relationship he was acting like a 14 year old boy just all of these stories and posts and and it just screamed look guys I'm getting laid again I'm having a shag again look guys I've moved on first it just it screamed that it screamed I'm insecure and I'm a teenager and call me controversial but I think if you've been in a very long-term relationship it's probably healthy to work out who you are outside of that before jumping into something serious not only uh, ever dating two women and then marrying both of those women but what would I know I'm not the king of mental health am I but the way that he was just flaunting his new relationship to show I'm over it I'm okay I'm okay I'm okay you know because that's what that screams because how happy are couples if they feel the need to tell the world how happy they are all of the time personally I just don't think it's very healthy I keep my relationships private because I think that's healthier than involving the world in my personal romantic relation right I can't speak for everyone and I shan't because that's folly. But if I were in that situation as the new girlfriend, I would feel like, am I being flaunted to try to make someone feel bad? And that wouldn't make me feel, that'd make me feel a little bit used, you know what I mean? But then again, she did get loads of followers and now they're married and they can both do lots of brand deals with their baby. So all's well that ends well, right guys? And when the new wife revealed this tidbit, and Tanya was getting overwhelming amounts of hate. And then the narrative was being formed on places like Twitter of Jim's such a good guy. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna kind of say it. I don't know these people, right? I think I'm a good analyzer of people, of humans though. I don't reckon she has it in her to physically cheat on someone. I don't, but I don't know her, but I don't really reckon so. I reckon she had an emotional affair with a guy from her theater group who was in a relationship. So I reckon she got a crush on someone. But Jim's ego to me seems so big that something like that would, it's not great. Emotional affairs and emotional cheating is, is still wrong. And I think like that's perfect grounds for a breakup. But I think he's giving a very biased perspective on what did happen. And his new wife has done the dirty work and saying this stuff online. And then Jim, knowing that he created a shitstorm, then did a Q&A on his Instagram, you know, sending questions, uh, like knowing full well that most of them would be about Tanya. And then he made one story about the situation saying that he was going to rise above it and not talk about it. So you got your wife to do the dirty work and, and get so frustrated that she spilled some stuff on social media that she shouldn't have, it shouldn't have come from her. And then you're going to act as though you're above it all, which makes your wife look really petty and insecure. Great, great guy, great guy. Do you know what? Don't pussyfoot. If you're gonna continuously bring it up in really snipey ways, in ways that lets the audience run wild with their imagination, I don't think that's on. Either say, yes, she had sex with someone else or she had a crush on someone else or whatever. Don't beat around the bush and pretend that you're above it when you are the one instigating these little dra petty dramas. Do you know what I mean? either say what happened or shut up because I don't care but I kind of do care because this is all research for my book since having his baby it's <laughs> during the pregnancy you would have thought that he was the one to be pregnant not his wife but it's very much my baby my baby my baby not our baby <laughs> our baby comrade you know what I mean he's just one of those types of people honestly I do go into this on my third channel there's a video about Jim doing something to his home showing someone around his home and there was another video and I don't think I've mentioned this there was another video I saw where they were talking about moving out of the flat that they were sharing into a house and he was the one that decided they were going to move whilst his fiance at the time was heavily pregnant 
all of this stress on it. But he was the one that wanted them to move. Oh, there's not enough space. There was enough space in a flat. And sorry, a baby, a baby stays in its crib. I mean, I'm no expert. I've not had a kid. But from what I've seen, yeah, babies just stay in a crib and they, like, you can move around. With, they didn't need to upgrade to a big house, but just it's just very much him, 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 his decisions. This is what I've analyzed under the guise of being a super nice hi best friends guy i just don't believe it maybe i'm cynical maybe i'm cynical but to be this version of you that lives right here and right now you are just about the most unlikely thing in the entire universe and that should be celebrated i wonder if he'd keep up that optimism if he saw me the most unlikely thing in the universe doing this youtuber book review the most likely thing in my universe I wonder if he'd want to celebrate me doing a video like this. I also know, because the people who found me via social media often tell me, that for lots of us, very often, it feels a bit too much. Every generation thinks it's the first to experience the hot mess of adolescence and adulthood, but for those of us who've come of age in the glare of the internet, we really have had to deal with an intensity to certain experiences that no previous generation has. I love my job, and I love the new ways of communicating, creating, and connecting the technology provides but it would be silly to ignore the stories, the studies and the research into how our constantly switched on world is impacting us. Mate, you are right, I agree with you. You're also terminally online. The day that Tanya Burr announced her pregnancy, Jim Chapman quickly put up a picture of his own toddler too. Am I cynical or is there something there and maybe not wanting someone, certain someone to get attention on their announcement day? Because it was a big thing. Some people theorise that she might be pregnant, but it did kind of come out of left field and out of nowhere. Am I cynical? Did he just want to share a picture of his toddler? Or was there a little bit more to it? Considering he is the one that brings up Tanya in interviews since the door. Do you know what I mean? Do you know? What, do you feel me? Like, lug off, mate. Just wait a day. There is enough internet space for the both of you. I promise. Her getting attention doesn't take away from your attention. Kind of does because she is uh, uh, bigger than him, but still. One of my favorite facts is that canned food was invented in 1810, but nobody thought of inventing the can opener until 1858, which means that for nearly 50 years, people must have been bashing cans against rocks and hoping for the best. I adore this book already. It sets out to be a book of, look at all these facts I know. I am so smart. I am so smart. S-M-R-T, I mean S-M-A-R-T. I am so smart. I am so smart. I am so smart. S-M-R-T, I mean S-M-A-R-T. But a quick Google tells me that A, people didn't bash cans against rocks, they used a hammer and a chisel. Convenient. And B, the first cans were actually too thick for our more modern methods of using can openers. They were also a niche item on the market, produced at a rate of six cans an hour, made from iron. They got replaced by thinner steel cans eventually, but to begin with, there was less of a need to have a can opener invented because they weren't a popular item on the market to buy. It took me a whopping two seconds to Google this info and educate you more than Jim has already. I should be the one writing a book like this. Me. Me. I actually have already thought of writing a book called The A to Z of Everything I Hate and just having it crammed full of factual and entertaining info on why I dislike everything from black holes to the wind to everything. I have considered it but then I couldn't be bothered. Moving on. Doing what I do means that I've met a lot of people, some of whom know me via my job, some of whom haven't got a bloody clue who I am. And almost without exception, the humans that live today are among the most intelligent, interested, funny, and surprising people you could ever hope to come across. What does that even mean? Every generation probably thought that, right? I think the rise of flat earthers has otherwise done it. I have a YouTube channel, as well as the other usual suspects when it comes to social media. I'm a presenter. Hmm. I do a bit of modeling here and there. I write for magazines and you might hear my voice on the radio once in a while. It's been a while, isn't it? Aged like milk. So throughout this book, I'll introduce you to a range of geniuses and remarkably interesting boffins. I've not heard someone say boffin since I was 13. So you know, eight years ago. Being alive is really bloody brilliant. Respectfully, I completely disagree. You are wrong. <laughs> I'm approaching 30 and will not hesitate to tell you that I'm totally unqualified for the mortgage I'm currently paying and the dog I am responsible for. 
Chapter one, nope, thing one, sorry, thing one. The chances of you being alive right now to read this book are about one in 10 to the power of 2,685,000. That's it. Man, I'm unlucky. I beat all those odds, that sucks. He's going on about the odds of all of us being here as if it's a good thing. But wait, because now we get to your folks engaging in intercourse, having sex, making love, bumping uglies, doing the no pants dance. <sighs> Why does he write like this? Stop. As much as you won't want to think about it, it's very unlikely that they did, it, no, it's very likely that they did do this at least once and I bet they enjoyed it too and made loads of noise and the moment of your conception. Everyone alive is the product of two people banging. More news at 10. I literally do not care. The probability of a sperm and an egg meeting to create you is one in 400 quadrillion. Again, I have the worst luck. You are rarer than a hen with teeth eating a four leaf clover with a snowflake on it. What an interesting diagram. The book is full of those. If you're still not convinced that you are a miracle, picture this. In the observable universe, there are 10 billion galaxies or possibly 2 trillion as of the end of 2016. I mean, who's counting? Each with an estimated 100 billion stars. That makes a billion trillion or one sextillion stars in the universe. A billion trillion looks like this. When written down, all of the stars we can see in the universe don't even take up a whole line of this book, but the probability of you existing takes up 954 pages. If that's not enough, the number of atoms in the known universe that make up those stars and planets and everything else that's ever existed and will ever exist is estimated to be 10 to the power of 80. And it's not even a scratch on you. Yeah, look at the odds against people existing. Certain people Everyone watching this video, th these are the odds stacked against you as you are right now existing. And yet the world is still full of massive assholes. So what is your point? <laughs> Thing two, curiosity killed the cat and hurt my testicles. Could have gone the rest of my life with a hand to think about your testicles, but you had to ruin that for me, don't you, Jim Bob? It's important to remember that you can't unknow stuff. You don't know me at all. I've unlearned more stuff than I've learned. I know that many of the things that help me find perspective freak other people out. For example, when I told my wife that the chances of her existing were one in 10, blah, 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 she said, I don't understand what you're going on about and it scares me to think about that. Regardless, why is he dabbing on Ta Tanya 10 pages into this? Me, big intellectual, I can handle big ideas because I'm so smart, me, 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 me. Dumb wife can't, she freaks out. She's so dumb and stupid and ditzy and tried to put a knife in the toaster once. Hee hee hee, wife big dumb, me big smart, believe it, believe it, believe it. Jam, ain't it a bit, ain't it a little bit sus? I can handle these big concepts, my wife can't. What, furthermore, she doesn't understand it and it scares her. It terrifies me. I do understand it, it terrifies me. There's nothing wrong with that. Shut up. Once a month or so, I'll have a bit of a bloody, bloody blitz, a body blitz from top to bottom. I'll give my beard an extra thorough tidy and get rid of those spare, sparse necky bits. Pluck any long unwanted eyebrows. I'll cut my toenails, trim my armpits, give my chest hair once over and have a crack at the other area you try to find significant. I don't need to know any of this. This is exactly like when reality TV stars start podcasts and then you realize that they're incredibly boring people, but they don't think they're boring because they are surrounded by yes men kissing their ass all the time. Yes, I'm looking at most of the Made in Chelsea alumni who now have podcasts. I'm looking at you guys. You're really not as interesting as you all like to believe, but because you're on TV, you have this overinflated sense of, sense of, I'm interesting. That is what a lot of these Brit vlog squad vloggers got. This overinflated ego in that everything they say has to be shared because it's interesting. I don't want to know about you cutting your toenails, mate. I'm really hang I'm really hangry right now. So I think that's affecting this video. He tells us about how he shoved a waxing strip on his balls to see what would happen, but it got stuck because it was too painful to rip off. I would not call my wife for help. I couldn't let her see me like this. I would have to divorce her afterwards out of sympathy for putting her through such an ord ordeal. Hmm. By this point, I can honestly say that any semblance of human personality had burnt away and I was the purest expression of my animal self. See, I liked this sentence. Oh yeah, it's not just me being a bitch, right? Chill out because I can imagine and relate to this. I think we've all done something to our bodies that in hindsight was stupid and had this raw animalistic panic over it. Like, oh yeah, once I did something stupid and I somehow 
got a hairbrush actually stuck in my hair. It was one of those hairbrushes where it's just cylindrical and the bristles are, are encompassing it you know, in a circular fact. You know what I mean? It was one of those ones and I was doing something with it. I think I was doing that and then I got it stuck and I panicked because I was getting ready for school, for secondary school and I got it stuck and instead of, I don't know if my mum was home, instead of telling someone who was at home, I just, I just went to school and I was trying to yank it out but it was proper stuck and I couldn't and then I saw one of my mum's mates and showed her and she was just trying to rip it out and it was hurting so much and I was panicking so much because she said we might have to cut it. And if we'd cut it, I would have had this much of my hair short. If I'd been older, I'd just made it into an undercut. But not being a 12 year old, I was panicking, man. And she ripped and she ripped it all out in the end. I had this like, I had this missing spot that luckily my hair was, it was fine. I just covered it. It just looked a bit thinner on that side. <sighs> Well done, Jim Bob. You've managed to write a sentence I don't dislike and it only took us 15 pages. And that might sound facetious, but I've read through Fifty Shades of Grey on this channel. I didn't like any of those sentences. So these are odds that I do like. How did we get here? Before we go any further, I'm going to give a brief history of the entire universe up to now. You're not Stephen Hawking, mate. Calm down. He tells us about the sun and how it's going to destroy everything one day. Boo hoo, who cares? This place sucks anyway. Boo! A billion years, you say? That's ages. A billion years ago, we were all just sludge, and now we have airplanes and iPads and emojis and keymojis. And another billion years, think of what we could do. Well, yes, you're right to an extent, but it will happen. It's non-negotiable. There's a better book for this type of information, if you're curious, uh, by Michio Kaku. I believe it's the one about parallel universes. I think, where he says that to avoid the big freeze that's going to happen once the sun dies, Humanity, if still around, will have to jump to another dimension or parallel universe to avoid it. That is interesting. Next, Jim tells us that humanity's overall quality of life is up, which is true. There's more food, less illiteracy, less infant mortality, etc. You and I are part of the most adaptable, resourceful and imaginative species on the planet and that's something to feel good about. <laughs> Spend five minutes on Facebook and you will change your mind. Jim tells us doing good deeds makes us feel better. Thanks. I guess my good deed of the day is that I bought your book with real money. You're welcome. One minute into the Big Bang, the temperature of the rapidly expanding universe, about a million billion miles big at this stage, was about 10 billion degrees. Yeah, that's nothing. I went to France the other week. No, I didn't. That was literally three months ago and it was 34 degrees over there. So one upped. Big whoop. If you decided to hop in your time machine, which doesn't exist, so you couldn't. Oh my God, really? No way. I didn't know that they don't exist yet, maybe. What a party pooper. What was that about it being imaginative just one page ago? Way to take the wind out of everyone's sails. Also, how would you know? I bet CERN has a time machine made out of a microwave right as we speak. You bore. Somewhere between three to four billion years ago, life began. I can't imagine it was a particularly thrilling existence for those beings. Yeah, it's hardly a thrill fest now reading this book. I envy the single-celled organisms. There's a brief lesson on cells and photosynthesis and evolution. Fast forward to 200,000 years ago and Homo sapiens arrives. Then at some point in the next 100,000 years, we appear. Homo sapiens sapiens. Pfft. Yeah, right, mate. Can't trick me. I've seen literally every episode of Ancient Aliens. I know the truth, mate. Despite our intelligence and the fact that we can trace life back 4 billion years and we are fully aware of what we are doing, we are still burning these fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide that was safely stored away under the crust of the planet. In just a few short centuries, since humankind discovered fossil fuels, we have single-handedly sent the entire planet well on its way back to an atmosphere that is entirely unsuitable for most of the living things as we know them. All right, here's a fun thought experiment for you guys. If something wiped out almost all of humanity tomorrow and we needed to start completely over again, stone age, right at the beginning, reset with the few straggled survivors we have around the world, we would probably never get as technologically advanced as we are now, because all of the easily accessible resources, minerals, oil, etc., has been used up. The, the surface level stuff that we only had to dig about this much to, that's all used up because we now have to dig deeper and deeper. We have to frack, etc. We have to mine really deep to get to the good stuff, right? That's what we have to do now. So if we had to start all over again and everything was destroyed, proper cataclysmic, you can't just use machines that are already here, all the resources gone, we wouldn't be able to get this far to this point because all the easily accessible stuff is gone. Something. 
You follow what I'm saying? We would be screwed. No more iPhones ever again. It's not immediately obvious, but keeping the internet running requires data centers that need energy to function and to remain cool. Even reading one of my tweets or watching one of my videos has an impact. So what you're saying is we should completely ignore your internet presence to avoid harming the planet. Easy, done, thank me later, Earth. At the risk of getting all preachy, which is something I always want to avoid, even though I'm passionate about this topic, what we have is finite and what we do has an impact. Should I get preachy with some facts about animal agriculture and the effect of carbon emissions or are we not ready for that conversation yet, Jim Bob? Ooh, I'll install solar panels, but I won't stop eating treats on pizza or eating tuna cans. I'm actually so petty that I looked up a recent vlog to make sure he hadn't gone vegetarian just so I could be snipey. Sue me, but I also like to be thorough. I like to be thorough when I'm being a dick. The next segment is about how weird pets are. Uh-oh, Martha talking coming. I've just said here what I already said about the beginning. Look, ultimately what happened to Martha is genuinely not my business, but can you flaunt animals online and use them in videos, pics, thumbnails, reviews, and then be surprised if people want to know what happened if they disappeared without a trace? If you don't want the nosiness, and I guess guard your privacy better like I do, I am the best. I guess that's the issue and the difference with vloggers. They share their lives. So people, their audience begins to feel entitled to information. Someone like me, I like to think that I'm not an influencer or a vlogger or anything. I create content like this and I keep my private life private. Like here's the side of me that I want out there publicly and the rest is my business. And I find that I have this clear distinction and people are actually really respectful of it. Like my audience is respectful of it. They get it. You guys get it, I think, which is great. So people don't pry. I also don't leave room for prying to happen. I'm very careful about my private life. I only, I'm only open with the stuff that I choose to be open about, but it's good. People don't pry. People don't even pry about my real name. People, people guess sometimes, but there's not the, a proper prying that I've seen, which, okay, great. So I'm left alone just to create my silly content that you can consume and hopefully enjoy. Great, like, well, it's worse, like a little handshake. I'll create this, you have a laugh. Seems fair enough. I think it's harder for vloggers to maintain privacy because they are selling their private lives. They're putting it all out there and they are selling it in exchange for constant brand deals, constant gifted trips and items. You can be famous and also be private. Keanu Reeves does it. He is one of the most recognizable actors, A-list a stars on the planet. What do you know about his private life? He has a girlfriend now. What would you know? Muffin. He, he does it. These people don't have that excuse. They don't want to use that excuse. They like putting all their lives out there. I just can't, I don't know. It's, here's a thing that influencers do, right? When they're trying to beg for free stuff, what they'll do is they'll go on Instagram and let's take air conditioning, for example, because it's the first thing that sprung to mind. They'll be like, oh guys, it's been really hot recently what brand of air conditioner would you say is the best? Or maybe they have a brand in mind and they'll be like, what air conditioner from this brand would, would you suggest me get? Do you really think that they're sitting there reading through their DMs to see what people are suggesting? No, they're hoping, and especially if they tag the companies too, they are hoping that they will get gifted freebies. Don't know where I was going with that. Imagine if you went to someone's house and when you used the toilet, they had a small tiger shark in their bath. Surely you'd have some questions. My question would be, cool, can I eat Jim's book? So why is it completely normal for us to have slightly less dangerous wolves? Well, Mr. Facts, wolves are actually shy and prefer to stay away from humans. So I wouldn't really call them dangerous. Hippos are more dangerous. Hippos are mental. You look at one and they will charge at you. But the fact that we have brought some of these animals into our homes is very weird when you think about it. I don't think it's weird. I think it's really sweet. I think it's like mutually assured survival back in the day. He talks about selective breeding with wolves, etc. I'm not sure why, but children and animals tend to really like me. Jim thinks that all the romantic women in his whole life have been obsessed with him. So I will take this with a fistful of salt. And here he starts talking about Martha. Instead, I ended up with the complete opposite, a teeny tiny miniature dash hound. Considering they're already a small breed of dog, mine is particularly minuscule. She has never really grew. She's utterly pathetic and would last five, less than five minutes in the wild before being eaten by a cat. Her legs are pointless. She's slow. It took an eternity to get her house trained. She barks like her life depends on it whenever the doorbell rings and she's stubborn. But she's wedged herself well and truly into the center of my universe. Awkward, isn't it? 
Here's another thing. I think that Tanya gets all of the blame for Martha disappearing, which is fueled by Jim's new wife, Sarah, said because she was once asked again on Instagram, this mind for useless information. I say this repeatedly. I can remember, like, I don't need the notes for this bit because I just remember it's just here. But I'm listening to this. What am I listening to? I don't even remember what I'm listening to at the moment. I'm listening to this audio book called Heaven in Disorder by Slavoj Žižek. Could I tell you what he, what the bit I listened to was about today? Well, it was about American US politics, but beyond that, can I tell you? Not really. But I can tell you what this person wrote on Instagram ages ago. Someone asked her, where's Martha? And she said, why don't you ask the person who was in charge of her? Which, let's be real. When you read something like that, you kind of assume the worst and think that something really drastic and bad happened because everyone just pussyfooted and beat around the bush about it, right? You would assume the worst. You wouldn't just assume, oh, the dog was rehomed and is happy and healthy with a new family. You'd assume something bad, like she got tipped by a car or taken to the vets for an illness or something preventive. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit dramatic, isn't it? But if Martha was the center of Jim's universe, then where was his responsibility towards her? I don't know, it's all theorizing. Maybe Tanya got her in the divorce and then did something, rehomed the dog without telling you. But who knows? None of us know. We're like, right, that is a, like that, if she did that, that's a horrible thing to do. Absolutely awful. But we have no idea. So we're gonna, your mind is going to spring to the worst case scenario when it could just be cleared up. You know how many times like that has trended? Where's, where's the dog in relation to these two? Honestly. One of her favorite pastimes is to lick inside my nostrils as deep as her little tongue can go, which is in fact much deeper than you'd think. I'm pretty sure she licked the base of my brain once. What in the white person is this shit? Why would you share this? It's actually disgusting. Why would you let your, do and I don't think that he's being hyperbolic. I'm pretty sure I've seen vlogs where, you know, he's cuddling Martha and she's like licking all over. But why would you let the dog a dog, any dog, lick the inside of your nostril. That's not nice. It's not hygienic for them. Forget about the hygiene for you for a second. It's not hygienic for them because nostrils and nose hair is where dirt and pollution gets trapped to prevent you from, you know, breathing it in. You ever blown your nose after you've like spent a little bit of time on the London underground? Nasty. And you're letting your, your dog lick that? It's not on. All dog owners think their dog is the best. Although weirdly, mine actually is. <sighs> Awkward, isn't it? A pup is not just for Christmas though. They require a lot of time and are a huge responsibility. They can be expensive to keep, but when you get in after a long day and you see how unconditionally excited they are to see you, it's totally worth it. Oh God. Oh God. This feels, it feels too easy. It feels mean, it feels cruel. Oh, the universe is so cruel and twisted. Then again, see, and I'm hypothesizing about things that have nothing to do with me because it's just, it's natural because neither of them will just say it and end the speculation. If Tanya rehomed the dog without Jim's knowledge or consent, because legally maybe she got it in, got the dog in the divorce, right? He would be well within his rights to reveal that publicly. Because if he really wants people to go and like give her grief and does it subtly through manipulating his own wife to reveal information when she's feeling overwhelmed and flustered because the influence of life isn't one that she was accustomed to. I don't know why I sound like Russell Brand when I do that. But if he really wanted people to go mental about it, he would, he would nudge the wife in the right direction. Because people would, because that would be a horrible thing to do if she did it without his knowledge or prior consent. But then... If he did consent to it, what? Both of them were just irresponsible. They've had this dog for a few years and and because it became the tiniest bit of inconvenience, they, who knows? We don't, I'm starving. Next, Jim wonders why we all wear clothes. Well, Jim Bob, we can't protect ourselves from the environment anymore, that's why. I can quite happily walk around my house totally starkers because in the absence of society, I know that I have no standards to keep up. Can you stop writing stuff like this? I don't want the imagery of you walking around starkers, mate. Also, a common behavior that occurs during court 
during, during courtship in a lot of animal kingdom is refusal. If you've ever watched a wildlife program, you'll know exactly what this is. One animal, usually the male, tries to impress the other, usually the female, by fighting off any rivals or displaying something big or colourful. When the female has picked her mate, she will display herself to let him know that the game is afoot. But she will often stop displaying as he approaches in a kind of, you've got to do better than that stud, manoeuvre to test his commitment. If he really thinks the juice is worth this the juice is worth the squeeze he will persist and the female is more likely to know that he means business this is refusal in practice for us it seems to be that our clothing is both alluring and refusing by wearing certain things we can accentuate our best bits and appear more attractive we can show our social standing by wearing a nice watch or designer labels but our clothes are also a barrier to the good stuff only when both parties are satisfied that they have made a good choice or that they are drunk enough to make that choice irrelevant do the clothes come off and the real fun begins also by this point Point, embarrassment is much less of an issue because you're in it together the euphemisms that he makes for sex makes me want to stay celibate yeah sorry mr elizy yeezy jim chapman has put me off sex for life he's going on about fashion i don't care very little. if you can tell i don't really care that much about fashion <laughs> well if it says all saints on it i'll buy it truth be told i'm over that too i went for a little phase of that and i just don't give a shit Let's continue, shall we? I'm very passionate about the fashion industry. So when I gush about it, occasionally the response I get is that it's vacuous and doesn't actually mean anything real, but I couldn't disagree more. Granted, from time to time, you may come across a small number of fashion wankers. These are easily recognized as people who take it all far too seriously, will judge you for wearing anything that costs less than a small house in Manchester, whose day has often been an utter disaster based upon their skinny decaf macchiato with almond milk tasting like ca the used cashew milk who endure... <laughs> Mm, good, huh? Who usually enjoy a double air kiss with the required moi noises. Why are you making fun of yourself? Jim Bob. Carl Sagan, how dare you speak his name? By extension, it's incredible how little of human history has involved the things that now utterly shape our lives. There's debate as to the exact dates, but most people agree that the link of time there have been what is known as anatomically modern humans is about 200,000 years. Fake news, mate. Aliens created humans millions of years ago. Get over it. Educate yourself. Watch the History Channel, but only after midnight when the pyramids start flying around in space. It's important to keep in mind, whenever the modern world feels full on, that everything we do involves us trying to solve new problems with old brains. Brains that have spent a huge amount of time becoming good at overcoming issues in an environment we no longer find ourselves in. When life gets on top of us, we have a tendency to think that the issue lies with our brains, that it's our minds that are in the wrong. Actually, we're giving it a bloody good go with hardware that is out of date. He is actually right. Good for him. Broken clocks and all that. The next chapter is called The Human Brain. I can't wait to see what insight it's Jimmy Bob has on this. Blah, blah, blah. We all get distracted. That is true. At this point in the script, this was the first time in over two months I'd come back to writing this because I kept getting distracted by doing other and seemingly better things. It's probably been about a month or so since I even wrote that bit. When you start taxing your noggin, is it possible to get the ick from a book? It's also worth keeping in mind that this stuff isn't just about concentration and mood. In fact, our relationships with our various screens might be contributing to the general increases in anxiety being reported. Shocked Pikachu face. 10 out of 10 acting. Oscar worthy. Humans weren't made to live in the concrete jungle. We aren't really made to do anything, number one. And number two, evolution has pushed us to this point and will push us further. Joe Rogan moment. Humans are the sex organs of the machine world. Have you ever heard of that quote? I'm going to repeat it a hundred times over the next a thousand podcasts. Sorry. We aren't built for the long-term modern day stresses of being overworked or not having enough money to pay the mortgage. Ooh, la-dee-da, Mr. Fancy Man with his fancy mortgage. Not as relatable as you'd like to think you are, Jim Bob. This book was only written five years ago. What the hell went wrong in this time? How is getting a mortgage impossible now? And that's me saying that. National treasure, worldwide heartthrob, incredibly successful, and easy, easy mortgage out of reach. It's madness, isn't it? It's getting more expensive to get the education they need to end up with the job they want. And all the while they are bombarded with advertising and social media posts of the perfect life they feel pressured to be living. I agree, but it is somewhat ironic for an influencer to talk about social media postings of perfect lives. Even when some social media influencers try to like post their imperfect lives to show that you don't have to be perfect, it's still like perfectly imperfect, you know what I mean? 
I'm such a cynic. The term being shit scared or shitting oneself when terrified didn't come about because of how easily it rolls off the tongue. Next time you watch a wildlife show, keep an eye on the zebra's bottom when the lion starts chasing it. If you're lucky, you might see a little bit of poop escape. Cheers for that, mate. Our environment has changed faster than our biology can keep up with. It's much easier said than done, but try not to sweat the small stuff. I am gonna do the opposite of what Jim Bob recommends. I will sweat the small stuff. I will lose the plot over the inconsequential. I will go to war and die on every single molehill I can. With God as my witness, I will become the pettiest person alive. I'm certainly not the rock, you're not. Why the hell am I reading this then? When that's not possible because I'm traveling, I'll take 15 minutes in the morning to jump around my hotel room like a lunatic, doing burpees and press ups and more burpees. Unrelated, but does anyone else hate the word burpees? It sounds like less of an exercise and more of what a mum says to a child who's drank too much soda. Jim then goes on about how he has to eat regularly like every few hours, not every single hour, every few hours or else he will be hangry. You want everyone to leave you alone, but you haven't reached the point where you feel so hangry that you're comfortable of being blatantly rude to people. Now your relationships with those around you are being put to the test and you've probably started to make a few snide comments or bitchy remarks. If you haven't, others are certainly making them about you. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always hangry. Of course, post hanger, one always realizes what an utter knob they've been and begins to apologize profusely. My wife has actually learned to see the signs even before I'm aware of where I sit on the hanger scale and will source food for me. It's very sweet of her and it keeps my embarrassing mood swings to a minimum, but it's completely in her self-interest. I don't blame her. On the rare occasion when she falls off the wagon, her hangry rage is directed at me. I see my life flash before my eyes. Not the arse, I'll divorce immediately. Professor Richard Wiseman, a scientist and author who literally wrote the book on sleep called Night School, reckons that a healthy night's sleep boils down to a few simple sets. Steps, not sets. These include not looking at a screen for 90 minutes before you want to go to sleep. 90 minutes, are you insane? No one can do that. If I can't look at a screen before bed, what am I gonna read on? Read from a book? Not having that, no. Thing 16, my wife is brilliant to chat to when she's asleep. Can't wait, this is gonna be a real snooze fest. Ha 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 ha. Me, honey, can you stop grinding your teeth please? Oh, who else but Tanya? She's a grinder. <laughs> MC grinder. She's a grinder, and the noise that comes from her face when she clenches her jaw makes me cringe in a way that little else can. Tan, you'd be grinding your teeth too if you were watching the same film as me. Me, what film are you watching? Tan, prunes. Me, prunes? To my knowledge, prunes is not a movie, but when having a conversation with a sleep talker, you are very much a secondary member of the chat and it's best to just go with the flow. But you know what prunes do to you, right? Prunes give her wind. We joke about it whenever she eats them. It's very patronizing and also I just didn't really need to know that about Tanya Burr. If I ever meet her, I'll be sure to steer clear of offering her a prune. Unrelated, who even eats prunes? Raisins, do you eat prunes or raisins? Not even that either. I think they're well ranked, little wrinkly, bleh, nasty. Don't dry up fruit. Do you know what the worst is? Do you know what the worst is? Not oatmeal raisin cookies. When you wanna get a flapjack, yeah? But there's like sultanas and stuff in it. No, not having this. Tan, are you the doctor? Yes, I'm the doctor. What can I do for you? I'm obviously not the, no, no way, really? God, I didn't know that Jim Chapman wasn't a doctor. Oof, oof. Egg on my face. But I've learned that it's usually best to humor her on occasions like just this. Very long pause. Apparently it takes about three seconds for a pause to be awkward. I want the cuddles to be warm like the broccoli. Broccoli cuddles? Yes, warm like the broccoli. <coughs> that was a pig snorting, that weren't a snore. <coughs> <laughs> Sound very light though, don't they? <coughs> hmm. To give this one some context, Tan had made broccoli to accompany our dinner that night and had accidentally overcooked it <laughs> within an inch of its life. What a fascinating insight to their matrimonial bliss. A constant refrain from anyone that spends time online is, why do some people feel the need to be so mean to one another? Because it's funny. Obviously I'm joking, it's hilarious. If someone in the street overheard something I said, even if they disagreed with it, they'd be unlikely to shout in my face that I was a waste of skin. But online when it's anonymous, when everyone seems to do it, you'll be amazed at the people feel, that the things people feel okay saying. Well. 
Joking aside, I do agree with this. By the same logic though, this is how I see it. If you were just on the street and some absolute random you'd never met came up to you and just said a bunch of stuff at you, I'm not sure about you, I would just ignore it and go on in my day. I'd be like, okay, that was weird. That's the mindset to be in with this. <sighs> but essentially, yes, I agree with this. And I just think, just don't take it in. Never listen to randoms on Facebook, the cesspit of all online opinions. It's really not. But the issue here is people like Jim and Alfie Days conflate online hate with genuine criticism. I think they do it disingenuously because I think they can tell the difference, but I think they do it on purpose as a catch all barrier and deflection. Alfie days, certainly. Do you remember when he had that meeting with Susan Majewski and was like, Susan, why is there such a good Alfie days impression? Why is there a dislike button? What's it even for? What do you think it's for? You donut. To show you dislike the video. <laughs> Duh. I reckon Alfie days is the one that got rid of the dislike button. Thing 18, you and you are totally different things. OMG, is this gonna be philosophical insight into how we aren't really actually ourselves, but we are the awareness behind our consciousness watching ourselves navigate through life? Is it gonna be that? I know that body image is a massive part of many people's lives. No, it's actually about how social and traditional media gives us poor body image, which yes, it does. I think it's gotten worse than ever with Instagram and TikTok, and you're not really designed to see so many pretty people. Like, you know, when you go on Instagram sometimes, it's like, oh God, it's just those girls who are well better looking than me and you feel, feel a bit bad. <laughs> what was that? We, you wouldn't have had that a couple hundred years ago. There was only a finite amount of people that you would have met in your life. Certainly not just the endless doom scrolling, the endless millions of people you can uh, look at. And attractive people usually are pushed more to the front of social media algorithms. So yeah, we're not really designed to see that. And that's why it's getting worse amongst other facets and reasons, obviously. However, we have also heard this same stuff said a million times before and in more effective ways. I would have preferred just reading something a little bit different. That's all a little bit more philosophical and insightful. I can guarantee you that your body is utterly and entirely wonderful because how can it not be? Stop looking at my body, Jim. Your body has been fashioned to carry the miracle that is human consciousness, the important bit that makes you who you are. Your brain is the most complex structure in the universe comprised of a hundred billion neurons. My consciousness is the worst part about me. And if my brain is so clever, yeah, why did I leave the milk on the counter and my phone in the fridge? Riddle me this, Jim Bob, riddle me this top 10 biggest mysteries of all time. He talks about personal family issues that he had growing up regarding his biological father. I was aware of a little bit of this, but he goes into a little bit of detail. And Jim has a very mature perspective upon the abuse that he faced. He also talks about his stepfather, who was more of a real father to him than his bio dad, succumbing to cancer. It's very bittersweet. It's very, it was, it was quite touching, actually. It was, it was very mature. By far the best piece of advice I've ever been given came in the form of a scruffy little note written by my wife and torn out of a cheap notebook. It consists of 14 words and I'm not exaggerating when I say that it changed my life. She wrote it for me in 2014 and I still have it face up in the drawer that I use most often in my office so that whenever I go to get a pen or a charging cable it's there looking at me in the face reminding me to kick ass. This is what it says verbatim. I wonder if it's still in his drawer in his new house with his new wife and every time the new wife sees it she gets the urge to spill more dirty secrets secrets about Jim's former marriage and Instagram. I wonder, <laughs> for your reference, the dream. That's awesome. I didn't make a note of what this note said. So I guess you'll just never know. For your reference, the dream has bubble writing, something about following your dreams for the DNR followed by a regular capital E-A-M. I imagine Tan was worried that she wouldn't manage to fit it all on the page if she continued with the size of the bubble letters, so abandoned ship after the first two. The big is all in bubble writing, but seeing as it only consists of three letters, space was, I guess, less of an issue. In defense of shoddy penmanship, my excellent wife isn't known for her artistic prowess, nor her handwriting, but the point is not how it was written. It's how she knew to write those words exactly. If the point isn't how it was written, why have you just spent a whole paragraph dunking on her? She was trying to do a nice thing, stop it. He says a bunch of relatable things about having YouTube as a career, relatable to me, that is, not to you. <laughs> I don't know why. 
<laughs> I don't know why I'm like this. But along with this can come the fear that although I'm putting my heart and soul into it and although I love it to pieces, it simply won't last in its current form and I must keep pushing forward so as to not be left behind. I always keep pushing forward until all of my enemies are destroyed. <laughs> that is where my wife comes in. She has been on the internet for a year or so longer than me and she just doesn't have the same concerns I do in that no, that's not what it says. Oh, I'm just making it up. She doesn't have concerns in the same way that I do. While I sometimes find myself terrified that it's all falling apart, she's aiming higher and but single-handedly kicking the world's ass. Oh God. <laughs> I wish I could show past her in the future. If you've seen clips of Tanya Burr acting, you know that it's not the best. And I think at this point, maybe she'd just done a few bit parts, like she was this cheese girl. If you know, you know, she was this cheese counter girl, right? And I believe at the time he was saying things like, she's taking Hollywood by storm, she's doing so well. And on a public level, I understand supporting your partner. Of course, I understand that. But part of me does think, look, Anyone with eyes and ears can see she wasn't doing a great job of acting. And as I've said before, or maybe I say later on in this video, I can't remember. I think she thought all she needed to do was get Margot Robbie's acting coach and then she'll be a great actress, not taking the time to go study at RADA or whatever. And Jim is not stupid. I would just love to be a fly on the wall in these people's minds because I would love to know if he really thought that she was going to do well of acting because she's just not she's not really got stage presence. Her accent in this Cheese Girl commercial, for example, or whatever it was, wasn't great. And I was talking to a mate about this this morning and they were like, well, remember Dick Van Dyke was in Mary Poppins and he had a horrible English ac accent. And it's like, yeah, 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 sure. Accents aren't the be all end all, but Dick Van Dyke has incredible stage presence and he's a singer and he's a dancer and he's all, and he can just, I can imagine he would fill a room if he walked into it. And she doesn't have that that I feel really mean saying that, but she doesn't. And I wonder if Jim really ever thought it was going to go well. And if he didn't think that, was he feeding into the delusions? And if he was feeding into these delusions of grandeur of... Tanya Bear really thought that if she just spent a year being an actress, she'd be in Hollywood films. She was saying as much when she decided to change career paths, right? If Jim wasn't buying it, but was feeding into the delusions publicly and privately regardless, where does that come from? Is it wanting to see your partner fail? I don't know. This it interests me. I want to know and I never will. The next segment is called Death and Life. Let's talk more about some, no, let's talk some more about life and death. Beginning with death. Why? I am studying philosophy in my private time. I do not need to be thinking about this shit in my work life too. Jimmy, stop. You're left with about 13,000 days into which you have to cram all of the people you'll ever know, all of the love, the joy, the pain, the laughter, and internet memes. And I can't believe I'm spending some of that time focusing on this. We must pay more attention to something where it's novel. That's how we learn things and why we are pretty good at not dying from eating raw chicken or playing with sharp objects. Speak for yourself. He goes on about lobsters for a bit. Sorry, Jordan Peterson. Another sea creature that has a bit of an ego and massive delusions of grandeur. Oh my God, is this about me? The Hydra is in fact not the serpent monster from Greek mythology, but a tiny little centimeter long tentacled freshwater organism. What a massive disappointment. They say never meet your heroes, that sucks. He's going on about water bears. They are very interesting. Give him that. They can withstand pressure up to six times that of the deepest point in the ocean. There is literally nowhere on the surface of the planet that exerts that much pressure, which begs the question, why are they so well and truly overprepared? That is genuinely really interesting. Maybe they came from outer space. Maybe they came from a planet where the pressure was a lot like Sirius B. And if we went there, we'd just be squished into little jelly blobs. It's all well and good stuff in this book with science facts. But I want more insights into his and Tanya's life so I can mock them through the power of hindsight. Birth, childhood and adolescence. I'm going to skip through a lot of the science parts going forward unless it's particularly interesting and just read out the funny autobiographical moments. I have nipples. You have nipples. We all have nipples. Obviously females use theirs to feed children. Oh no. But if you stick an infant on either of mine as hard as they suck, nothing is going to come out. Maybe a little bit of blood if they really go for it, but certainly not milk. Jim, no, stop. My nipples are completely pointless. Have some more confidence, mate, body positivity and all that. During the first four weeks of development in the womb, male and female embryos are indistinguishable. There is no little willy, no tiny test. Stop. Icky. Little willy. 
No tiny testicles, but there are ween... Why does he write like this? He's writing like this to wind me up, I swear. There are wee nipples because we are all female. Sexual dimorphism takes effect when the male-specific Y chromosome does its thing if one is present, turning the baby into biological boy. Yeah, don't tell the gender purists this. They will literally shit themselves in outrage. What do you mean? We were all women at one point. No, men. Whenever I tell people I have a twin, the first question I'm always asked is, are you identical? Nope. I think we look more like cousins than siblings, although we resemble each other most when I'm tired. He looks a bit like me, only puffier. Yeah, someone's not bitter. We have always been very different, and although we've always loved each other dearly and had each other's back, when we were younger, we would argue a lot and fight a lot. John was always stronger, but when he pushed me too far and my temple would flare, he'd always be the one to start running. Apart from that one time when I had him pinned down and was threatening to dribble in his mouth until I accidentally pulled the trigger and the spit tumbled from my lips and slowly dripped into the inside of his cheek where it became indistinguishable from his own saliva before I could suck it back up. On that occasion, I was the one running. In fairness, he still owes me a major dead arm for that. You know, there are some things that you don't really need to share, right, Jim? And then, this is a fun one, I had to be circumcised at the age of 15. I'm just looking to see where I asked. It all got a little much. And I have to say, I didn't handle the news that the doctor wanted to remove past my penis as well as I could have. My British stiff upper lip failed me and I may have shown a little weakness. Pfft, that's it, British, this is it. Re revoked. You know what I was trying to say, give over. My mum had to step in and give me some perspective. I distinctly remember her saying, listen, Jim, in a few years, you'll look back at all of this and laugh. You'll have great teeth. You'll be walking upright. Your nipples will be fine and your willy will be unstoppable. Did she actually use these words, Jim, or are you just saying that? I have a BSc. I don't know what that is because I'm uncollege, nope, ununi educated in psychosocial sciences, basically psychology, from the University of East Anglia and half a master's degree in psychology from the University of East London. It's important to point out that there is actually no such award as half masters. What I mean to say is that I was doing my MA part-time over two years instead of one while working at the Levi's store in Chapelfield shopping centre in Norwich to pay for it. That's a lot of information. I didn't ask. Oh my God. Whoa, that was an overreaction to what I just had that. A bit embarrassed. When this YouTube thing I was doing on the weekend started to show real promise, I enjoyed that much more than psychology, so I just never went back to studying. And you know what? I think this is a crying shame. So many YouTubers do this and then tell their audience, don't worry about education. You don't need it. It doesn't matter. Like life can go in many, many different ways. And I agree, but... Jim has had the money and the time to finish his degree, especially if it was only two years, only two years, come on. My college course is two years. YouTube isn't going to last forever unless you can be versatile and get into related industries, different avenues, or if you make so much money like PewDiePie has that it just doesn't matter if it does go away tomorrow because you've got a net worth of like 100 million. Jim wrote this years ago, and what's happened since then? Years ago, this is only five years ago, his online career has dwindled and his screenwriting career is, oh, I don't wanna be rude because it's me, me, not wanting to be rude. I'm getting so soft in my old age. Do you know what actually? I mean, if he didn't finish this and he wants to go into screenwriting, if you have the money and that's what you want to do, then why wouldn't you go, like, just go and do a degree in it as well? Because it's not, I suppose it's not just about the education side of things. In some industries, like media, it's, it's, it's useful having the education, but it's also really useful to have on-set experiences because you can be an A-star student, but if you're an arsehole on set, no one is going to want to work with you, right? So you're probably not going to get any work because your reputation has to matter in those types of industries, right? But at the same time, because I did I did media at college and then I didn't go on to university because could be asked, mate, huh? too good for that? No, I was just, I just didn't want to go, that's all. But some of my mates went on to university to study media and I'm talking about media specifically because like he basically does media and I'm doing media kind of now, just digital form. And my mates went to university and they made lots of contacts there. It was almost like this great place for networking. And a lot of them have gone on 
Um, I've got some really successful mates who have worked in, you know, like the Marvel films and the Matrix 4 and like all, all the new films you used to see come out. Like Mowgli, I went to one of my besties. He was working in that. So we went to this like cast and crew screening thing together a couple of years ago. And then sometimes they get to work with people that they did their degree with. There was a lot of networking that went on in that space, which has probably proven quite useful over people who maybe didn't have that networking opportunity and background, you know? Because like, immediate is kind of like who you know, right? What I'm saying is, if he's had the money and the time, he could have part-time done some sort of degree in writing, journalism or screenwriting or whatever. And then he would have met lots of like-minded people in that industry. And you know, it's kind of like Tanya Burr going on to do acting. She got, I think Margot, because I think she's obsessed with Margot Robbie, Margot Robbie's acting coach to give her like one-to-one -one lessons. Okay, so? So you're getting one-to-one -one lessons with action co actor codes like once a, once a week or so. Go to RADA, you have the money. You can buy your way in to uh, like do a few terms at something like RADA. Maybe she did try and they rejected her. <laughs> I don't I don't know. What is my point with this? I, I've gone completely off script as you can tell. Yeah, his screenwriting career, it, it's full of um promises and he's working on this, he's working on that, but does it amount to tangible things? not from what I've seen. So I think if they want to, and if they want to branch out of YouTube ultimately one day, YouTubers who are successful and have made a lot of money via the platform should consider continuing higher education just in case, but also to be further educated on a specialized subject. Why not? They have the money, they have the time. That's why I've gone back to college to do my philosophy degree. Nope do my course and then get my A-level and then I'll go do a degree or whatever. Because I decided, right, I'm gonna be like Slavoj Žižek, that's what I've decided. This is my new life ambition, yeah. Do a bunch of stuff in philosophy and then just make documentaries on stuff I find interesting, like he does. The Pervert's Guide to Ideology and The Pervert's Guide to Cinema. And bearing in mind his degree was only two years gone, I think he should have finished it just in case. It'll be good to have on the CV because like it or not, the amount of times in London I was just as capable of doing a job and going to job interviews as the the other people being interviewed, but I was passed over because I did not have a degree. Sucked. I mean, I've done all right eventually after being broke for so many years and living in a tidy one bedroom flat with my best mate living on the sofa in the living room. I did my time, guys. Never having any money because I'd spend it all on cocaine. Okay. <laughs> Having to do, God, I used to, I used to have to do, I would try to do any job, but I got bored really quickly because the undiagnosed ADHD, right? So I'd do like the leafleting stuff on the streets where you're getting paid like eight quid now to hand out leaflets. And, you know, I did my time. I just think it was a bit of a, it's a bit of a shame that he, he didn't really finish it. Obviously higher education isn't accessible to everyone, which is when they tripled the expenses from three grand a year to nine grand for the, yeah, the university fees. Exceedingly common England L. But it was accessible to him. He could have just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What's my point? Who cares? Speaking from personal experience, the chances of you knowing what you want to do with your career at 18 and making decisions that would dictate the rest of your life when you've only been allowed to drive for one year, you can just about drink alcohol legally and you probably can't even, haven't even cast a vote in your first general election, is totally ludicrous. If this is you right now, it is okay to feel like you're fumbling in the dark. In fact, I would go as far to say it's more than okay. It's totally normal and entirely to be expected. And I completely agree with this. I didn't go to university because blah, 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 blah. I couldn't, I couldn't be bothered, mate. And they just raised it. Had they just, or am I making that up? I'm probably misremembering it. I don't know how, how old am I? When did that happen? Hmm, Lib Dem Coalition, um, Nick Clegg, whatever happened to Nick Clegg? Do you know what he's doing now actually? He's trying to get the weed legalized. Love that for him. Not for me, I don't smoke as you, can you tell? But love that for him. I didn't go because I knew that I would just uh, waste my time partying and not doing the work because I've had a hard time doing and diagnosed ADHD in all, all my life, okay? I've had a hard time, right? <sighs> Trying to concentrate on schoolwork. I didn't really fancy going to, I wasn't ready to go to a new city by myself and, you know, branch out. Wasn't ready for any of that. I, I wanted a bit of work experience first, I suppose. But the irony now is that a decade later, I'm doing 
A-level philosophy to get the qualifications I wanted when I was 17. Granted, it took me years of messing around for me to be sure that that's what I wanted to do ultimately anyway. So that's, that's great. And if I'd gone on to university, I would have ended up not doing the work and failing, but he talks about booze next. By the time I got to 19, I still hadn't learned when enough was enough and decided to stop drinking altogether. I didn't touch a drop for the following seven years. Then, when I was 26 at VidCom in Anaheim, just outside of LA, after an extremely long day of meeting thousands of viewers, you'd be surprised how exhausting that can be. I'm not surprised by that at all. God, having an interaction with the cashier at Tesco's is tiring enough. I suddenly felt the urge for a beer. I don't know why I act like I'm this grouchy person that doesn't like to talk to anyone because I will, I love talking to people outside. It makes my day, I'm so American. I suddenly felt the urge for a beer. I only had two, but after my stint of being teetotal, that was ample. I discovered two things that night. I'm a lightweight and I had finally found where my limit lies. From that night on, I became a much more sensible drinker after being teetotal for seven years. It's really interesting, but... The thought that I have is why bother? There for your body, not some, not your mind, because there are conceived benefits to the mind when you drink alcohol. Oh, having a drink or so gives me a little buzz and then I can relax and stuff, even though you're just normalizing yourself to this Pavlovian response to be relaxed by a glass relaxed by a glass or two of wine in the first place, and there are better ways to relax for your don't start preaching. But for your body, for your actual body, there's zero benefits to drinking alcohol. I'm teetotal, as you all know, because of addiction. And I listened to this neuroscience podcast called Huberman Labs with Andrew Huberman. Love him. He is my idol. He's spoken about this. Andrew Huberman's spoken about this a few times on his podcast. So I'm basically an expert on this. But we know that alcohol isn't good for you. So why bother at all? It didn't if you want to relax then have a bath have a bath get a bike i ride to work every day 80 miles both here and here are as red as a fire engine but seriously society nowadays looks down on anyone socially smoking or smoking once a month to relax alcohol is actually just as bad you should just go listen to andrew huberman talk about this stuff because he could explain it way better than i could but it is a carcinogen it does cause cancer not may it it does alcohol and cigarettes they basically <laughs> rewire and mutate your dna and not in a good way i'm on day six of s- stopping vaping well done me but it's just you know you've had these bad experiences you you went sober for seven years then you're like do you know what actually i will have uh, one or two drinks now because it's, it's just whatever whatever that was all he had to say about alcohol <laughs> nothing and now he wants to talk about sex it's as simple as this love not, not like, not he's like a bartender. Look, it's as simple as this, love, yeah. Get out of here, get out of my pub. It's as simple as this, love. No matter who you feel it for, opposite sex, same sex, all sexes, everyone, yourself, is love equally as powerful, equally as triumphant. What about nonces then? What about maps? Checkmate bigger. <laughs> the thing with sexuality is that it's a human trait, just like person. <laughs> It's funny because I sent this bit to um <laughs> to some of my LGBT homies and the consensus I got back was why is it, why is a cis straight guy trying to trying to educate me about sexuality? <laughs> just like oh no, I didn't get this bit right. The thing with sexuality is that it's a human trait, just like personality or height or skin tone, and as such, it's not just black and white, on or off, gay or straight. It's a continuum, and continuums difficult to measure. I got confused by this because height and skin tone very much are, and this isn't a pun, black and white. Height, you can't change your height when you're fully grown. Skin tone, can't change that. I could change, I could change this artificially. I wouldn't know what it looked like, but you can't actually change your skin tone. So, so he says sexuality, it's like, I'm very, I'm actually very confused. So it's a trait like height or skin tone, personality can change. It can change with head traumas. It can just change with um, experience and new things, whatever. Height and skin tone, just a trait, like height or skin tone. And as such, it's not just black or white, on and off, gay or straight. A continuum is a continuous sequence, i.e. fluid, gender fluid, sexuality fluid, whatever. I just don't think these examples, maybe I'm just being stupid and I'm not really getting it and I'm not seeing the forest for the trees. I just don't think these examples put together really, really work properly. 
It's a human trait. As such, it's not just black or white, on or off. But height very much is black or white. Bored of that now, continuing. People differ in every possible minutia of every possible distinction. I disagree. I think that 80% of all people ever are joyless robots. <laughs> this section lasted for three pages and amounted to homophobia equals bad. Wow, Jim Chapman ended prejudice. That'll show everyone. I am being facetious. Of course, it's nice to show that you are an ally and I'm sure it's very appreciated amongst people. But this book is full of sciencey facts. So to back up what you're saying, why not mention all the animals that have been found in nature that experience homosexual relationships or or amphibians that can change gender? Clownfish, you know, clownfish, they can, they can change gender. Because in Finding Nemo, I think the blokes can... T There's something weird. What, what is that thing about Finding Nemo? It's, it's something... Finding Nemo. Gender swapping abilities of the clownfish. Clownfish have the incredible ability to change genders based on their social environment. And by explaining how this change happens, we're going to see why Finding Nemo isn't as wholesome as you think. This is from a, a site called thefocus.news. We all know what happens in Finding Nemo. We do not need a recap. All clownfish, Amphiprionine, also known as anemone, anemone fish, anemone fish, anemone fish, are born as sequential hermaphrodites that first develop into males. This means that while they are males during early development, they also carry the capacity to produce female reproductive organs. Specifically, clownfish are protandrous sequential. What is this? This is like Boris Johnson talking when he called people like protoplasmic invertebrates or something. Are you saying they, don't, they haven't the guts to put questions to, to me? What Great it, um, supine protoplasmic invertebrate course. jellies. The storyline issues for Disney start when we learn about the amazing gender swap abilities and social structure of clownfish. Since the fish never show far from the anemone at home, anemone, anemone, I don't know, because of predators. If the alpha female dies, it would be incredibly difficult for the males to find another female to breed with. In put, instead of putting the survival of the group at risk, the dominant male would transform into a new alpha female by maturing the ovarian reproductive tissues he had been carrying since birth. At the same time, each immature male moves up the hierarchy, meaning the cycle can repeat continuously, meaning that the babies can have sex with the dad. Since Nemo is the only other clownfish around, he becomes a male and mates with his father, who is now a female. Should his father die, Nemo would change into a female and mate with another male. Anyway, what was the point of that? Just ruining childhoods everywhere. Oh yes, the, the fluidity of animals and nature. That's what we were talking about. I'll just use an example right there of things happening in nature that bigots will want to say it's unnatural. It's unnatural for people to be gay or whatever. Just calling homophobia bad isn't exactly going to change any bigot's mind. People who like to call homosexual unnatural, boom, there is a nature. It's happened. Gay penguins at the zoo, that type of thing. I'm going to blow people's minds even further right now and say that anything unnatural can't actually exist. So there, beat it. That is what unnatural means. It's not my argument. Yuval Noah Harari in his book, Sapiens, came up with that argument that anything unnatural just simply wouldn't exist, which is why you don't see humans running at the speed of light because it's unnatural, so it can't possibly happen. So the argument of they shouldn't do that over there, I don't agree with it, it's unnatural. If it was unnatural, it simply wouldn't be a thing in the first place. Uh, and that's a much smarter person than me using that argument. So, hmm. No one can argue with me. And if you do, I won't read it anyway. Jim's first kiss traumatized him because a girl lunged at him when they were 12 and snogged him. Oh God, do I really have to talk about this? I remember my first ever proper kiss with tongues, not silly pecs. Yeah, tongues. I was 14 and the guy was 18, which is mad now, isn't it? Ooh. And he just kind of did it. I wasn't read really that into it. It wasn't anything like, no one lunged me or anything. I was just, I, I kind of did it because I wanted to experience it, but experiencing it, I wasn't into it. Everyone had been drinking and it felt kind of gross. It's like, oh God, there's just like a tongue in my mouth. And I actually ended up dating this uh, 18 year old for all of a few, few weeks. And then I dumped him for being clingy and immature. <laughs> hmm. It's a difficult thing to trace back particularly far, but we know from hieroglyphics that the Egyptians didn't tend to kiss. We know that our close relatives, chimpanzees, do kiss, but it's mainly a kind of makeup thing between male apes after a fight and not connected to mating. Bonobos do actual Frenchies, the sexy thing. Stop giving me the ick. My wife and I didn't fall in love at first sight. We didn't even fall in lust. The truth is, she thought she'd found her new gay best friend in me. Extremely common Jim Chapman L. 
women fetishizing the ideal of a gay best friend is, I think, a form of po- positive prejudice. I don't know if that's a thing, but I'm coining that phrase now. I've done it in the past too. Oh my God, tihi, totes gonna have a gay bestie. I've done that too when I was younger. It's a really common trope in media. I also grew up uh, watching, I watched loads of Ruling Grace because I loved Jack and aspired to be like Karen. <laughs> on on drugs before i even really knew what it meant hmm red flag and i was re i was re-watching it uh i was re-watching it the first season recently and it was a bit it's not really aged very well to be honest what does that's why it's called progress you know why is this chair so small oh god yeah it's a common trope in media but gay men do not exist to be straight women's besties they exist to do what they want Tan had met Ryan, which is one of Jim's friends. Who I don't like this guy. <laughs> met Ryan. He's not famous or anything. He's just in this book and I don't like him. At a Baby Shambles concert. Remember them? Held in the same location as the block party gig a year or so prior. He had a long-termish girlfriend and would never cheat, but he did enjoy a good flirt. He was very confident, very good looking. <laughs> And he wore the skinniest jeans around, which seeing as this was at the height of the indie scene in 2006, may as well have been a pair of very tight babe magnets. He had this troubled, mysterious, loner in a group of friends vibe that girls seemed to be really into and he enjoyed the attention while I mostly watched in awe. And I have no idea who Ryan is, but I'm gonna dunk on him and say, I guarantee I would bet this glass of water that he cheated a few times. Cause listen to this next bit, yeah? Well sus. During the gig where Tan and Ryan met, Ryan invited her and Kate, still, I'm not saying Tan anymore, still Tanya's best friend to this day, to a house party that he, myself, and the other five boys were hosting a few days later at their grotty, damp carpeted, why does the inside of your house smell like humid yeast house? Of course, when the night of the party arrived, Tanya and Kate had to get a bus from the village they lived in, and Tanya was so keen to meet the boys she'd been obsessing over that they were the first guests to arrive. Way to play it cool, Tanya. So he would never cheat, but he invited these two random girls he met at a gig to a house party where his girlfriend is as well. And why has Jim been patronizing to Tanya? Oh, way to play it cool, Tan. Is he just jealous that she fancied someone 15 years ago? I could see that Tanya's little heart was broken. They told me that Tanya had the hots for Ryan and that she thought he was single and interested in her, to which I told her as sensibly as I could, whatever. Like Ryan's a douchebag. She clearly got that impression for a reason maybe jim just doesn't want to believe that his friend ryan would act like that but she clearly got this impression that he was single and liked her for a reason and then he invites her to a house party where his girlfriend is and then runs off to hang out with his girlfriend and she's like oh, douchebag douchebag and jim if you can't see that that is just men defending the 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 sussy behavior of other men in it the whole time I just thought that Tanya was the most stunning creature I'd ever seen. I remember thinking that Tanya had very nice teeth. I have a thing for good teeth. And I loved the way her mouth moved when she smiled. So you loved her smile then, Jim. Why not just say that, you future serial killer? I can hear the bathtub full of lye bubbling for his next victim as we speak. For legal reasons, that was a joke. Unless... The next day, Ryan and I had work. We were both feeling a little fragile, but I would not shut up about the girl I had met the night before. I told him the story about how she fancied him and how I had been her shoulder to cry on and wouldn't it be weird if I were to pursue it after that, to which he laughed. Zero remorse for leaving the hopeless Tanya Burr on. I don't know who Ryan is, but he is now the primary antagonist of this book and I will find him and destroy him. We texted and called each other a lot. She would swing by to see me at work or meet me on campus and I would wait in Starbucks for her to finish on many occasions. I was very inexperienced with girl so i text her things like i like you can we go on a date soon please oh oh i had no idea that that wasn't the done thing apparently you were supposed to play it really cool and leave it two days before getting in touch and then be really mysterious and unavailable when you did ironically jim's way just being honest is very healthy and the norm is pathetically dishonest and time wasty and just annoying there's being way too keen, of course, but to just show excitement that you'd like to hang out with a person and get to know them better, if the vibe's right, that's quite exciting. Like, no messing around, you know? 
I'm a very hard man to please and my standards are extremely high. By now, if you've read much of this book, you must have realised that I'm interested in the scientific method. Not that I'm qualified in science, just that I'm thoughtful, can be quite pensive and methodical. I tend to analyse and think hard before making decisions. I always want to know how things work or why things do what they do, but Tanya came charging for all of that like a bull in a china shop, clumsy and quirky and jam-packed full of charm, and I fell in love with her within a month or two, which I think is fast. She fell in love with me first, though. She told me so via text message. I think I already said, I think I think I've already said this is just how he talks about the primary woman in his love life. Tanya's obsessed with him. Sarah's obsessed with him. The baby's probably obsessed with him too. It's almost like this odd one upman one upman ship. She fell in love with me first though, but it's not a, it's not a competition, mate. It should be a nice thing. No, she fell in love with me first. Shut up. Now he's writing a letter to some girl that he had a crush on one time 15 years ago, snore. I appreciate now that your boyfriend, who was also 17, but actually looked 17 whilst I looked 14, was a much better catch than me and that you strung me along because you liked the attention. That was totally normal on your part, but I had never had much attention before and I may have got carried away. I told my big sisters that you're my girlfriend. They both still hate you for breaking their li little brother's heart, by the way. Get a life, get over it. That was like 10 years ago. Either way, I'm sorry for being such a needy weirdo. Rare Jim Chapman's self-awareness. Let's be honest. I've got a headache, let's be honest. People can talk about love all they want, but the nitty gritty of the sex bit is really strange. It's such a deep seated drive in all of us that we rarely stop to think of it. Ha, what about people who are asexual? Ha, not inclusive, are ya? But trust me, it's mental, just for a minute. Well, she was wearing a top cut so I could see the shape of the glandular and fatty tissue of her t chest, which is generally thought to be very attractive and which caused my external intermittent organ, which by the way happens to also serve as a ur urinal duct to fill with blood. R slash I am very smart, the human body, the next segment. Of course, this is a very fleeting visit to the massive concept and if you do decide to do a little digging yourself, you'll likely discover the wonders of RNA, amino acids, chemical evolution and metabolic pathways. It's all a lot to take in, so I shall leave you with this thought. If indeed life was not a random chance and molecules do self-organise and self-assemble, regardless of how tiny the probability, with the sheer number of Earth-like planets out there in the universe, maybe the chances of life existing elsewhere aren't all that low. Ooh, pretty controversial moment. Aliens might exist, no way. <sighs> so annoying. Do normies just think that aliens existing is a pretty far out concept? <laughs> As someone who continuously falls over his own feet, all right, Bella Swan, calm down. We get it, you're quirky and not like the other boys because you trip up. All of a sudden, it actually took, m oh yeah, and I think there's an issue here. All of a sudden, it actually took millions of years, hyphen. You have a front end, but all of a sudden it actually took million. I think he's missing a hyphen after all of a sudden. It actually took a million years, like as a snarky aside. Just what I'd like that. Thing 54, we all like big butts and we cannot lie. No. Butts are brilliant. Stay away from mine. Butts are brilliant. Have you noticed how the human rump is larger and more bulbous than that of most other animals? Each cheek is made up of two fairly large muscles, the gluteus maximus and gluteus medius, or maximum and medium, as well as a generous helping of fat that makes them super comfy to sit on. These muscles and fat are what gives our bucks and butter, butter, bottoms their shape, but the anatomy alone doesn't explain why we need stops for voluptuous, or oh, this is killing me. Rear ends. Surely we could have those fat deposits in our feet to make sitting less necessary or spread out over our entire bodies for better insulation. Or we could have altogether smaller gluteus muscles to save on the energy it costs to run them. The reason our bodies are so bootylicious is because we walk upright and it's our derriere that helps make this so. I'm convinced he only wrote this paragraph to wind me up five years after the fact. Humans are not your typical predator. And while the horse is having to lie down to gather its energy, good old Blorf the Padfoot, that's the name of our big butted hero, he's really good at tracking by the way, has been following its trail at a steady jog. Once he catches up to the exhausted and defensive animal, he quickly dispatches it, dismembers it and carries it home for the tribe to eat. The horse gets eaten and Blorf is a champion. In reality, Blorf would have most likely had accomplices, but I couldn't think of any more prehistoric names, so I just kept the lone wolf, Blorf. Ah yes, that famous prehistoric name, Blorf. Your anus is a sphincter, but sphincters are not anuses. A sphincter is characterized as a ring-like muscle. They can contract or relax to open, close, restrict, or enable bodily passages. I'm, at this point, I'm quite confused by the target audience of this book because he and the British vlog squad, I think it's very fair to say that they had young teenage fans 
let's be real, primarily girls from what I've seen. That was the demographic that seemed to enjoy Zalfi, Tanya, Jim, etc. But there's all this factual talk of sphincters, as if teenagers aren't going to giggle about it. It's a bit adult. Maybe there's a huge overlap in people who enjoy Zalfi and people who also enjoy scientific facts about the human body. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did a survey beforehand. Who knows? He says bits and bobs a lot in this book. It's like British beauty vloggers who always pop products on their face. I can't believe I'm only on thing 58 and I've been working on this book for months. Send help. I like to think that I have a relatively high ouchy threshold. This follows my point about the target audience thing. He also has this habit of talking like a three-year-old adult concepts, three-year-oldish, like like childish language. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I don't. I don't get it. And by adult concepts, I don't just mean early talking about adult things, but the, the terminology that he uses in the explanations, it, it's it's quite mature. I don't, mm, I don't get it. I know for sure I'm not the target audience, but I'd like to know who is. I can be hedonistic. Imagine Jim Chapman chucking back ecstasy pills and having a gangbang. It's not entirely awful either. People have worse vision than that hyphen. It's happened again. I think there should have been a hyphen after either and before people. It's not entirely awful either, hyphen. People have worse vision than that, hyphen. Because otherwise it just sounds a bit awkward, sounds clunky, it sounds rushed together. So I think there's an editing issue here. And do you know what? Maybe the science from this book was all copy and pasted from Wikipedia, but there is a lot more effort put into this than Shane Dawson's books. So I'll give Jim that. He gives a horrible account of his laser eye surgery that I shan't repeat. Apparently it sounds worse than the procedure actually is, but eye touching makes me squirm. My friend Claire has a sister four years her junior called Gemma. One day, Claire and Gemma's mum, Susan, chopped Gemma's finger off. I'm told it was an accident and in Susan's defence, I've known her for over a decade and she doesn't seem like the finger amputating type. From what I understand, it was a simple case of, whoops, I slammed the door and didn't realise that my two-year-old's fingers was in the way and now it's no longer part of her hand. I thought that this was a nice book, not a horror, Jim. If the finger is left in a warm environment, you've got somewhere around the 12 hour mark to get it reattached. But if you're doing something particularly exciting and don't want to let a little thing like a part of your body falling off to ruin your fun, keep it refrigerated and you can buy yourself anywhere up to four days. That is useful to know. Thanks, I'll bear it in mind in case I get the urge to chop my fingers off. Animals. I'm six foot three, which is tall enough that people mention it. The only one here mentioning your height is you. Why does my dog barely have any legs at all? Why has your dog disappeared? If penguins aren't your favorite animal, they are. This is very conflicting, I love penguins. Penguins and dogs and wolves and cheetahs. You need to have a good long think about what kind of person you are. I love them for the same reason I love my tiny rubbish dog. They're pathetic and clumsy, but possess a lot of gumption and still exist despite seals and orca whales and freezing cold seas all trying to murder them. They just don't give a shit and will continue being tenacious little penguins no matter what mother nature has to say on the matter. Jim can't talk about loving something without being deprecating about it and it's annoying. I have had and loved all of my dogs, all of my, I've had so many animals and I've loved all of them. None of them were rubbish or pathetic. Remember when I had rats? I loved those little buggers. They were naughty. They were cheeky. They would, they would, they would do, they would work together and do naughty things. I loved it, but they were not pathetic or rubbish, even though, even though they were domesticated. Obviously I just didn't pick, I didn't pick any off like the London underground one day and take it home. Domesticated rats, they, they can't survive in, in the wild. They're basically like little puppies. They're quite different from wild rats. Very, very intelligent. So yeah, if they were put in the wild, they would probably get eaten straight away and they would have been scared and stuff, but they were not rubbish or pathetic. I loved them. I bet he doesn't say, I love my baby. Even though she doesn't do anything and sleeps all the time. Maybe he does. I don't know. But I doubt it because mum's net would have an absolute field day. Oh, who am I kidding? He's not relevant enough for mum's net. Never mind. This is... That's very mean of me. It's octopuses. So says the Oxford English Dictionary, the final arbiter of such a thing. Octopedes is also acceptable, but I've never heard it used in real life. Therefore, next time I say octopuses, don't be a smart ass and tell me that actually it's octopi in a smug tone of voice because you'll be making a mockery of the English language and a complete tit out of yourself. This is what Rachel Oates told me as well. So I'm inclined to believe it. They are, it goes without saying, awesome. So I will now be spending six pages talking about them. If you don't like dinosaurs, you can skip to page 210. However, be warned that we probably can't be friends anymore. Oh no, what a shame. I'm knocked out of the running of being one of Jim Chapman's besties. Boo hoo. When asked what your favorite dinosaur is, if your answer is anything other than the Velociraptor, you're dead to me. You're a normie. My favorite dinosaur is Jeff Goldblum. Not because he's old. 
just because he was also in Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs are mad, innit? Thanks, thanks for sharing that thought, Elise. Trudon was a relatively small bird-like dinosaur that measured in at about three feet tall, but it was a genius. I mean, it could do long division or anything. This, uh, tr Trudons are actually my favorite dinosaurs because they might have possibly evolved into reptilians. Seriously, look it up, it's a thing. When I say it's a thing, I don't mean educate yourself sheep or not like that type of thing, not like going on truthism.net to find out the truth by the Illuminati. Scientists theorize that because of its large brain size and because I think it was bipedal, it might have eventually given a couple hundred million years of evolution, gone on to become upright, walking, talking, big breath, like us. That a humanoid reptilian from the Trudons, like how we became humans from a shared ancestor with <sighs> monkeys or something, I'm dying. Anyway, I had a book about dinosaurs and it had a page about the Trudons and there was this artistic interpretation of what a modern day Trudon would look like if it had evolved into this upright reptilian, basically reptilian type creature. And I'll show you a picture on the screen. It looked like this. This is a model, I think at a museum somewhere. And this image of just the, the, just the face was blown up A4 sized in my book and it always scared the shit out of me because just look at it staring back at you. Sometimes when I'd read it and it was a little bit dark, whatever, it just, it would give me nightmares. I'm pretty sure I had nightmares about this alien looking ass. I don't know why that makes it my favorite dinosaur considering it gave me nightmares. I guess I'm just a masochist. Of course, Jim Chapman doesn't mention any of this, which is actually interesting because he is in the Illuminati and doesn't want any of you to discover the truth. Imagine if the British vlog squad actually were in the Illuminati. It was just like a new, a new wave, a new gen of trying to get their subliminal brainwashing advertising out. That would be literally the worst secret cult ever. I would not want to join. The only Illuminati I like are the ones who do the secret sig symbols in Lady Gaga videos. I'm not interested in Zoella being in the Illuminati. The reason that boffins think he says boffins a lot. He calls people chaps, etc. I know this is going to mean nothing to 100% of you lot watching right now because you will never meet him. But Jim writes the way that my father talks and I can't get it out of my head. Fears. Some people are scared of snakes and some people are scared of heights. I'm scared of belly buttons. I don't like to see people poke theirs. I can't prod yours. Like, I didn't want you to prod mine. Just realized what I was saying. And if you attempt to force me to touch my own, one of us is going to get hurt. Here's the thing. When somebody tells you that they're scared of spiders, you don't throw a spider th at them unless you're a horrible moron. <laughs> but when I tell people I hate navels, the first thing they do is either get their own out and start fingering it. What? or come at mine with a digit extended. Watching somebody put something in their belly button is toe curling for me, but having somebody threaten to put something in mine is enough to hurtle me well over the edge of being a calm, civilized man into becoming a full bone, irrational maniac. I don't think that's irrational. Like what weirdos do you know? Why are people just like touching your belly button? Xanthophobia, fear of the color yellow. Turophobia, fear of cheese. Genuphobia, fear of knees. The way that I can hear his thought process for this little bit. Right, gotta write down some random fears for the book. Mm, let's make it simple. Let's pick a color. How about yellow? Ooh, ooh, what's, what, what's, what's yellow? Cheese, so what's the fear of cheese? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, what next? Oh, what rhymes with cheese? Knees, so what's the fear of knee? These are right in themselves. Thing 81. The reason we haven't seen aliens is because they're biding their time before killing us. Illuminati propaganda, ele 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 they're already here. I am one, because as much as I try, I just cannot mimic human speech properly. I just did some Googling. I already mentioned the stuff at Martha, didn't I? I don't know if I've already said this. I've forgotten from all of two days ago. Random reminder that Jim and his new wife exploit their child by posting so much content about her to try to scrounge freebies or hashtag gifteds without her consent about having her childhood public and monetized because she's a one-year-old who can't possibly understand what her parents are doing. I don't, I'm really tired, so I don't wanna get fully into it. That's my controversial opinion. I don't think people should be able to exploit their babies or children for money and views because the kids can't have a say and they'll grow up and maybe they, you, it's like Pandora's box. You can't close it once it's open. So if they grow up to be 16, they're like, actually, I don't like that so much of my life and childhood was on the internet. You can't take that back. You can't. So it's better to play it safe. 
Plus, look, my generation, we were always told, don't tell people on the internet your real name. Uh, don't share your location. Be careful about who you talk to because there's nonces everywhere. Imagine, and Jim's like, Jim's several years older than me, actually. So he should know even better about like all the not great people. There, there was a whole thing recently. Eleanor, someone, um, some mum fluencer who keeps up, like, what, uploading content about her child, do, like doing things that should be innocent, like eating a banana. But as a lot of women know, if you eat a banana outside, some men are gonna sexualize that. As as a lot of women already know that, right? And and the, the comments that are on this, that this person gets on their Instagram, it's just really weird. And there's there's men, and the, the mum's not doing anything about it, even though there's clearly men out there on, online right now being attracted to your three-year-old kid. Ban it, ban it all, ban babies from being online like what does a baby want to do with instagram anyway it's not for their benefit like the baby instagram means nothing to a child you know anyway i don't want to get fully into it it's a convo for another time anyway jim believes in ghosts because a room in his house when he was younger was haunted he believes i used to be convinced as i've said before that my kitchen was was haunted with aliens in my back garden so and certain points of my old house, it felt a little bit off. Hmm. At one point, and for a very long time, in the absence of anyone else present, we felt a person sit on the edge of the bed. We were too scared to peer out from under the blanket, but we were both absolutely adamant, even though we couldn't have been older than five, that nobody entered or exited while we had been in there. So for a while, I was getting a lot of sleep paralysis when I wasn't sober. Fingers linked, stress, that kind of thing. And the people who say it's all in your head are liars or have never experienced it because I'm convinced that I had some sort of fourth dimensional stalker because at several points, oh, once I felt something like try to spoon me or, and another time I felt the covers kind of, and you're, you're, you're lying there, you can't move, sleep paralysis, right? I felt the covers kind of lift and the bed depressed a bit as if someone had sat and there was no one else in the room. Oh, the covers moving, seeing stuff on the, what? The trouble with it being haunted is twofold. Firstly, it means that ghosts exist and I'd rather live in a world where they didn't. And secondly, why? How? Could it not be something extra dimensional? Some sort of crossover perhaps from the fourth or fifth or sixth dimension. What's so anti-science about believing that? Huh? That's pro-science. International beings just like watching me right now, having a laugh. Thing 84, we'd best not make anything smarter than us. Can't wait for this. Our brains are super duper complicated. Speak for yourself. On the off chance that your Greek is a little rusty, Anthropocene derives from Anthropos, which means human. It's our fault. Jim acting as though he doesn't Google the meaning of Greek words. Jim is anti-artificial intelligence, so he is in good company with me. Why are my friends so stupid? Why do I get messages like this? Look at this message I just got from Callum, who does my podcast with me. When I was young, my favorite character in Titanic was the captain. I have no idea why. He had like two lines in the movie. He said that half an hour ago and I didn't respond. So he's just followed up with, I just thought he was a cool dude. That literally thanks for nothing. That is negative information. I have lost brain cells reading that. Next is swimming, his thoughts on swimming. My friends, and this includes my wife, I'd hope so, I'd hope your wife is your mate. Oh, oh, <laughs> didn't age well, sorry, read the room. Have a tendency to lead me into the deep end, like a sheepdog herding its quarry, where they'll prod me until I sink. Once they're satisfied that I've gone down deep enough, they will drag me back to the surface, give me a second to catch my breath and burp. He will burp, not the friends will just like burp at him, they just always belch. Burp explanation imminent and start again. It seems to provide them with hours of entertainment while I constantly feel on the brink of death. Why is he always writing my wife? It's just easier to write Tanya. We know who your wife is. One of the worst things about my swimming is the breathing technique I adopt. There isn't one. I panic, so I gulp air in, along with an alarming amount of water. Some of the air goes into my lungs, although not as much as I'd like, and some of it goes into my stomach. Within a minute or two, the gas that went down the wrong hole begins to come back up in the form of belches. You are too comfortable with your audience whoever it may be for this book. There is this uh, <laughs> incredible diagram of Jim swimming. I unironically love that. I think that's great. Thing 86. If you own a gun and something good happens, don't fire it into the air to celebrate. <sighs> Controversial statement. Bet that ruffles some feathers. Probably best not to have a gun at all. Volcanic take alert. I love it when the British vloggers get 
political. <laughs> I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, I wonder what would happen if an impromptu visit to space came about and I packed in a hurry, remembering my swimming trunks but forgetting my spacesuit. What if, for some reason, while only wearing swimwear, I didn't wear my seatbelt and through a freak set of circumstances, I found myself exposed to the vacuum of space in my Speedos bikini on trend retro one piece, would I die? This is like questions that I would ask my dad when I was little, like, Dad, if you stood outside in minus 20 degree weather, would you die? Would you die if you were completely naked? What about if you were naked in minus 100 degree weather and it was snowing? Dad, why are you leaving to buy cigarettes? You don't even smoke. That's actually something I did ask my dad once and I went on for ages. Like, what about this? What about this? What about this? He was like, yes, yes, you, you'll die. Look at, look at this drawing as well. Who made these drawings? Who is the target audience for this book? I'm going to try and skim the rest because I'm... Just getting bored. On nail biting. I know I do it most when I'm anxious, bored, chilling out in front of the TV or performing a menial task that doesn't take up a lot of brain power and where my hands are relatively free. Like driving, for example. Sometimes I'll get out of my seat after a long journey and find myself covered in bits of nail and dead skin. It's foul. My dude, you absolutely should be focusing on driving and using both hands properly on the steering wheel. Thank you. This is why people get into accidents. There's so many accidents per year in cars. They get two lakhs. When I am ruler of the world, I'm going to make, this is one of the first rules, annual driving tests mandatory, but paid for by the state because I don't want transport, personal transport to be inaccessible to people because of finances. Where will I get this money to have every, all the drivers in England, all the millions of them, take a free driving test that they have to pass, otherwise not that I was on the road every year. Where will I get the money? Well, for starters, I'll actually tax big corporations properly. Oh, but it might make them flee to other places where they're not gonna, then you can't sell any of your products here. Sorry, Amazon, Starbucks, Google, the rest, all of them. Long credits list here. Can't sell any of your products here. 66 million people, you're not gonna, I'll make my own Amazon, like how Russia made their own McDonald's. It's such a bogus argument. Just threaten to not allow people to sell their products. They will cave and start paying. Let's not get into it. Vote for me. <laughs> if you've ever been outside, I'm willing to bet my mortgage. Bold of you to assume that we can relate to either of these things. He has a whole segment simping over my mortal enemy, the moon. I am not listening to this celestial propaganda. I don't like to admit it. He's over the moon now, by the way. But I truly detest spiders. I don't want to be just another statistic, just another person who has fallen victim to the most cliched fear out there. So I've told myself for a long time that it's not arachnophobia, that I'm just not a big fan of them. But I think that it's time I confess that I might have a problem. The irony of a cookie cutter British vlogger not wanting to be seen as a cliche. Spiders freak me out too, but to be honest, we probably freak them out as well. So... All's fair in love and war. I started Googling, I, start, I did do this. I started Googling pictures of spiders because I'm a masochist. The big fat hairy ones, I don't think are so bad. The ones with the big bulbous eyes. I know that can freak some people out, but I don't mind that too much. And with the massive fangs and stuff. I wouldn't want one in my house, but I don't mind that too much. What freaks me out are the ones that are really just sharp and thin and spiky. They're all angular. They look alien. I have nightmares about these spider things. I've been having this fun dozing off hallucination recently where, I, where if I doze off and jerk awake, which I do frequently because I'm terrible at sleeping, I'll see like a blotchy, for a, for a few seconds, I'll see like a blotchy spider type thing with, with dozens of legs. And the first time that ever happened, it freaked me the F out. There's nothing wrong with me. It's just, uh, I don't know. Don't worry. There's nothing wrong with my brain. It's quite a common phenomena. It's just another reason for me not to want to sleep properly. Jim met a big spider once. It could go into the oven where it would stay, sucking the juice out of unsuspected insects, growing larger and larger until it was big enough to kill my dog, maybe up my leg where it would climb under my t-shirt and further. I think there's a word missing here. The spider would grow larger and larger until it was big enough to kill my dog, maybe up my leg. I think I was gonna say maybe go up my leg, crawl up my leg. Jim Bob, are you sure this was edited properly? Are you sure it was proofread properly? I'm good at pointing out these things for your next book when that comes out in five years time hire me i will do it for free so i like pointing out things wrong with stuff <laughs> jim traps the huge spider but decides to kill it upon this logic 
spider lovers beware. What if when I put the paper onto the glass and picked it up, the amphipod was so heavy that it made a dent in the paper and then left an opening between the glass and paper that it would take advantage of and run up my arm and onto my face? What if it could bite through a sheet of paper and into my skin? What if it remembered me and would seek revenge? Why, like, don't use flimsy, just A4 bog standard paper. Use thin cardboard or a magazine or thicker paper, like the ones you get for takeaway leaflets that get posted through your letterbox. That's what I use them for, picking up spiders. The only option I could think of was to kill it. I could have stood on it, but I wasn't wearing any shoes and I certainly didn't want a spider gunk on my bare feet. The amount of times he has actually also mentioned his feet in his book, not saying anything peculiar, but just referencing the fact that feet exist and he has feet. The sheer privilege of men being able to acknowledge that their feet exist without immediately getting sexualized for it. In case anyone tries to start, I have hooves like a devil. I wouldn't argue with you if you said I was overreacting a teensy bit. At six foot three inches, there it is again, I'm a pretty big guy. The amount of times that he has mentioned that he is six foot three inches as well. Bro, this is a book, your book, not your Tinder bio. We don't need to be reminded. Thing 96, when the zombies come, the odds don't look good for humanity's survival. In Walking Dead, which is my favorite TV show, BRB, deleting my Walking Dead games. Everyone likes to think that they would be brilliant in a zombie apocalypse, great at hiding and an expert at taking names with headshots and baseball bats. But the reality is, is that when an outbreak starts, the odds are that healthy humans won't even know what they're dealing with and will try to avoid killing the zombies thinking they're just unwell. We will quarantine them at first, but of course that will do nothing and they'll keep biting the people looking after them. Hard disagree with this statement, yeah? This would make sense in a universe with zero zombie media and fiction. As soon as that first person bites someone, and infects them and kills them and turns them into a zombie, we will absolutely know what we are dealing with and react accordingly. Do you know the US military, maybe our military does as well, but I just know random facts about America for some reason, because everything I know about America is against my own will. The US military has, oh, I can't think of the word. I can't think of the word. The Pentagon has a plan to stop the zombie apocalypse, seriously. They have blueprints, on shelves for almost any contingency. Need a response for a nuclear missile launch, have to rescue a US ambassador kidnapped by drug lords, a detailed strategy for surviving a zombie apocalypse, check. Yeah, the, the US military has these contingencies for all types of things. I think it's it's not like they're just having a laugh with it. I Maybe they are, or maybe it's, oh God, I know nothing about the US military really. I think they have these contingencies as thought experiments or just so that they're prepared for anything, I don't know. Jim thinks that in a zombie outbreak, we would be doomed. I respectfully disagree again, because I've thought about this a, a lot. Zombies, the ones that he means, the ones that I means, the dead coming back to life, biting and infecting other people, dead people not a virus reanimating the, the dead corpse, which can happen and has happened in nature with some insects. So very much it's a thing that is possible or, or like funguses that take over. I think he mentioned in this book actually, ant, ants can get this fungus that takes over their brain and compels them to go to the top of the tree, etc. I'm talking about these zombies, not zombies where it's magic. Zombies that might be feasible infected people and not just a really advanced form of rabies making people superhumans. I'm on about the traditional, they die, they come back to life, they have to have their brains destroyed. I'm talking about these zombies, right? The fast zombies, if they attack, look, everyone can just get fucked, I'm out of here. But yes, the, the traditional zombies are dead. Because they're dead, they cannot regenerate cells. Every small cut and bump and bruise that you get on a daily basis would add up on a zombie quickly and incapacitate them eventually, they cannot heal any of these little cuts or scrapes or whatnot. If zombies can only die by having the brain destroyed, well, zombies are dead, right? The blood's not running through their body even though how they animated, but whatever. Once the brain starts to decompose, it turns to mush, it liquidates really fairly quickly. And if that didn't happen, maggots and birds would make quick work, especially maggots, they will start eating all the, you know. And once the bodies start to really decompose, they would be unable to walk, unable to keep themselves warm because how are they gonna regulate their own temperatures? How is their metabolism? They're dead. Zombies would freeze in the winter. 
In hot summers, they would decompose and get eaten by wildlife, by maggots, by insects faster. In a zombie apocalypse, this is what I think, the most important thing would to be just to survive as long as you can until the zombies all die of very natural causes. I would give it one year for all of this to happen tops. Then, like The Walking Dead discovered, the biggest problem would be the other survivors living in a free-for-all land where there is no law or enforcement. So good luck with that. Now we move on to stench. I am writing this in the knowledge that even though I can't smell it now due to the fact that your sense of smell is dulled at altitude, when I land after my 12 hour stint of soaking it all up, there will be a layer of stink on me that is not easy to shift. It's a pretty hefty cocktail of all the food and drink on board, people's fecal matter and flatulence, as well as all the years of general torpid pong that has settled into the leather seats and the carpeted floor. Then there's the dehydrated breath of your fellow passengers, your own breath, everyone's sweat, their attempts to cover the sweat with perfume or deodorant and fumes from other planes when waiting in line for takeoff or coming into land it all combines to form a stagnant whiff that penetrates your clothes sits on your skin and lives in your hair it's grim and i'm very upset that i have to sit through the reminder of this flight before landing going through passport control collecting my luggage getting into a car and going home where i can wash it off it's ruined my holiday to be honest boo hoo the poor plane stink has ruined the rich boy's holiday where 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 i'm crying into my bed made of cash and diamonds People shouldn't eat other people. You cannot tell me what to do. Thing 101. It's best not to eat yourself if you can avoid it. Rage against the machine moment. Annoyances and grievances. America does a lot of things better than us Brits. <laughs> what? This whole section is just about stuff that annoys him. It's basically my idea of the A to Z of everything I hate, except he wrote it first five years ago. I'm fuming. Dear wife, your hair is not special. That's rude, isn't it? Like everyone else's hair, it does not dissolve in water. Therefore, I would greatly appreciate it if every once in a while, you would empty out the sink trap in the shower. As much as I love you, I will not hesitate to file for divorce if I had to plunge my hand into the plug hole to extract your grotty discarded clumps of cold, dank, matted locks, congealed of old conditioner and mildew one more time. Love you to the moon and back, Jim. This aged well. Remind me to never, ever, ever mention my boyfriend ever again because who bloody knows this is a completely irrational pet hate and i dislike myself for mentioning it but for me the turn of phrase equivalent of scraping na- oh even oh even saying that's just no even saying that's just made me funny scraping na- fingernails down a blackboard is when somebody says a time oh no it's like a chain reaction in my head because i think of i think of like that and then i think of nails or trauma which makes me feel a little bit icky but wouldn't I can't, even, I can't actually even talk properly. Wooden spoon, no, not spoons, wooden sticks, lollipop stick. You know, like magnums and that wooden lollipop. I'm going to be like this for ages now. It just messes with my, I hate, I hate them. Like them scraping against your teeth as you try to like bite the ice. No. It's when someone says a time followed by one of the qualifiers, AM or PM, followed again by another qualifier in the morning or in the evening. Everyone does it and it makes me unreasonably mad. By telling me that it's AM or PM, I know if it's in the morning or in the evening and you're repeating yourself. Save the brain power, save the oxygen, save our friendship, save our time and just pick one way of informing me about what part of the day you're referring to. This is something that I would say is incredibly petty. Maybe we could be friends after all, Jim. I draw particular attention to that latter liquid. Candle wax is solid at room temperature. It's not until it's exposed to heat that its state alters to liquid. So why on earth did my wife think it appropriate to pour hot wax down the sink? Sinks are usually colder than room temperature. Her disregard for basic physics dumbfounds me. As soon as it hit the plug hole, the wax solidified and blocked the pipe good and proper. Ha ha, wife dumb, me big smart. This happened, by the way, when they were dating. So when Tanya was 18, big, who cares? Leave her alone. Sometimes food looks like one thing but tastes like something else. Case in point, I once ate a little bit of potpourri thinking it was a sweet. If you've never tried potpourri, don't. It tastes like soap. If you've never tried soap and so can't emphasize, don't. It's not worth it. I've tasted soap before. One time, my sister had the very first Grand Theft Auto game, but her and her friends were excluding me. They weren't letting me play it with them. They were six years older than me, to be fair. So I was like the annoying little sister. They wouldn't let me play with them on the PS1. So I got big mad and upset and tried eating some soap. I can't 
really follow the logic here. You know, like one of those dove blocks, not like liquid soap, but one of the dove blocks. I'm not sure how that would have convinced them to let me play Grand Theft Auto, but okay. I would not recommend, by the way, it doesn't taste great. Cutting hair can leave strands with a sharp edge that can easily pierce and enter your skin like a splinter. I'm not a hairdresser, but I do have a tale to tell about this phenomenon. A tale that has left me very wary, very wary, very... Seriously, dude, I'll proofread your next one. Of stray hairs on bare skin. A tale of pain and discomfort and a shrilled wrinkle. Before I tell this story, I just want to point out that I'm aware that I've already mentioned my own penis in this book a few times. I didn't... And I nearly didn't include this fable for fear that you'd think me obsessed. I'm not obsessed, but the truth is a lot of odd, mostly unfortunate things have happened to my willy and it has a lot of stories to tell. I assure you, again... No one asked. And again, who is this book for? His teenage, primarily female audience? Adults? Who? I'm an adult. And I don't really want to hear about Jim's dick, thanks. After all, I share my bed with my wife. I sleep in a racing car, do you? I sleep in a big bed with my wife. Oh, yeah. Why is he always calling Tanya, my wife, my wife? His audience knows who she is, because... The audience most likely found him via Tanya in the first place. Sometimes in my content, like on my podcast and stuff, I'll refer to other people in my private life and I'll be discreet about it. I'll be anonymous. I'll say my mate, my boyfriend, whatever, because I'm respecting their privacy. It's a, it's a, my private life is very separate to this. And I wouldn't want people to get hassled on my behalf either. So when I say like my mum, my dad, I don't use their names. It's a privacy, it's for me, it's a bit of a respect thing, you know. No one's asked me to do that, but I've taken it upon myself because I'm such a good person. It's a safety and private thing. I'm not doing it to be like, mine, 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 me, 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 my boyfriend, my parents, my wife, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know why he keeps saying my wife, my dog. It's just easier to say, we, we know your wife, we just say Tanya, just say Martha, we know who they are. I don't, it's odd choice, odd choice, but okay. So he's in the shower, he finds there's a hair on his penis that he's woken up with. Well, I pulled at this hair relatively sharply and felt the tension run through it as it got caught on something. He mentioned that he was in a bed with his wife because it was a long hair and Tanya has long hair. Before I felt the pain and realised that the thing it had got caught on was the underside of my penis. Somehow, in my sleep, I presume, this hair had thread itself into a loose knot. When I pulled at it, the knot tightened and cut into the skin like cheese wire. Oh. I went to the bedroom to find my glasses and have a closer look, but it's quite hard to see the underside of an unhappy penis, even with corrected vision, without contorting into shapes that the body won't allow. So I called Tanya, who was overjoyed to get involved once I had confided in her about what had happened. She loves to be part of things, especially secret things, and this was a secret. Yeah, I'm sure she was so obsessed with you that she was beside herself with joy to help you unravel your penis from an errant hair. He goes to the doctor to fix it and ends up flashing a child. Apparently that was also my cue to leave, but I was unaware of this and lay there on the bed until he walked back in with a mother, father and small child who all looked as horrified and shocked as I felt. The doctor said, oh, you can go now. And I didn't reply. I was too crippled with shock. So I simply pulled up my underwear in front of a small child, her parents and a nonchalant doctor and left. My penis recovered, but my dignity has never been the same since. Honestly, Jim, your life is so tragic. Myths, lies and urban legends. For some reason, whenever myths are involved, I always just think it's going to be about cryptids. It's not, I was disappointed. If I were being responsible, I would say something along the lines of whatever you drop, wherever you drop it, regardless of how long ago you dropped it, don't eat it. If it's watermelon from a flat surface, definitely don't eat it. But I like to live life on the edge and if I drop something tasty, nine times out of 10, I will still eat it. I absolutely do, I, I do not do this, no. And I have a little dog running around and making a mess. My house probably has more bacteria in it than most, but I'm still around, so screw it. You do you and adhere to the five second rule if you like. Just don't say I didn't warn you when your tummy explodes. Jim, please stop it. Don't do that anymore. You have a kid now. Don't do that. When you think about it, banging drinks together is such an odd thing to do, but then handshakes are an odd way of saying hello. Why not touch elbows? How much has changed in five years? Now, thanks to COVID, touching elbows has actually been super common. I'll do that with my all the time rather than a filthy handshake. If you do manage to invent a time machine, I implore you to use it for humanity's greater good or at least to bring me a baby dinosaur. However, if your decision is to kidnap a newborn, you'll be looking at going back around 50,000 years or left to be sure that you can raise it to modern standards. Of course, then you have the issue of the child's timeline. Had you not been a monster and ripped it from its mother's arms, what if it happened to be one of your ancestors? 
This is just called the grandfather paradox, actually. And by pilfering it before it had the chance to reproduce, once you get back in your time machine head home, you never existed in the first place. What if this child would go on to invent something great like the wheel and when you arrived home, we were all still living in caves, dragging things uphill? What if this kid carried a gene that would make it immune to some virus that was previously killing humans and never got a chance to pass that immunity on? You would end up killing the entire race, you arse. Well, if you accidentally stole your own ancestor and then that caused you to not exist, if you didn't exist in the first place, you wouldn't have been able to go back in time, steal your ancestor. So it creates a part of the grandfather paradox. Same with the second example. If you do something back in the past that causes us to still live in caves in the present, you couldn't have created your time machine in the first place to do that. So maybe the timeline would protect itself and just not allow you to go back in time and mess with anything anyway to prevent paradoxes from happening and the universe imploding on itself. Unless we go down the Steinsgate route and you cause a fork in reality. So you end up, when you return to the present, you've actually ended up jumping to a different timeline altogether. So you're not really time traveling, you're timeline traveling, parallel universes and realities. But it, basically don't worry about it, mate. This final segment is called Reasons to be Cheerful. This is actually the name of Ed Miliband's podcast. There is literally no original four anywhere. Even me saying that ain't original thought. Thing 135, we're not as bad as you might think. Spend five minutes on Twitter and then tell me that with a straight face. I've tried not to be driven by money or material things, but it's easy to get caught up in the luxuries my job has to offer. However, losing my stepdad in the process of writing this book has really hammered it home. You can't take the money and the stuff you've bought with you when you pass away. Brian invested his time in people and relationships. And in the end, what really matters is that he was loved. He was so loved, in fact, that he had the busiest room in the hospital, full of friends, family, well-wishers, and even extra nurses who had taken a liking to him. In a ward that was all too full of patients who had nobody, Brian had a small army of people, all by his side when he passed. You can't buy that. He's right. What I wanted to do with this book was to give everyone as many different ways as possible to think about life and their own existence, whether that's in time or space, or just seeing that we don't have it all worked out. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, come and let me know. If you didn't, well, just keep that to yourself in honourable silence or better still, lie to everyone you meet and tell them it's bloody excellent. See you later. Oops. Acknowledgements. And of course, to my beautifully sold, endlessly patient and brutally honest wife, Tanya, who has tolerated me throwing random facts at her since very soon after we met and still, despite that, seems to be quite fond of me. Oh, and a canine shout out to my dog, Martha, who sat on my lap for at least 138 of the 147 things oh dear things that didn't age well that thoughts to sum up do you know what it's all right oh yeah i went there yes yeah it's all right obviously i like to poke a little bit of fun because that's me that's this channel but if i was to sit here and be like ter absolutely terrible book uh, that wouldn't <laughs> terrible a terrible book is anision's books that make no sense it's literally just gibberish it's like he's vomited onto the keyboard they're offensive to read that is a terrible book i do think that a lot of this was a lot of the science was probably copy and pasted from the internet and then changed slightly just to avoid plagiarism claims from wikipedia but it's still you know out of youtubers books it's a lot better than nishan's books but i'm aware that bar is incredibly low it's better than i've read shane dawson's books this is better it's, it's better than that I don't really get the target audience because sometimes it's a bit adult and then sometimes it's a bit childish. There's too much mention of Jim's penis. His writing style, it's not really for me. I find it a little bit icky sometimes. It's not for me, but I'm sure there's plenty of people that enjoyed that. I actually appreciate that he tried something different because it's not this auto, it's not an autobiography. It's not fiction. It's here's stuff that I find interesting about the universe and here's some of the science to back it up. I can appreciate that. Fair enough. Good for you. It's all right. It's fine. It's not a waste of money. And I did. There were some facts that I found interesting and I indeed learned. Can I think of any right now? No, because I have ADHD. So if you ask me to think of things, my mind literally blue screens. What? But I haven't read, read this. I've never seen this book before in my life. I thought, yeah, I thought it was fine. I didn't find it funny, but my sense of humor is incredibly advanced. My sense of humor is really stupid. I'm sure there's people who would find this funny. There were some nice moments when he was talking about his stepdad. There were some mature moments interspersed with all the really immature moments. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I think a British person saying it's all right is pretty good praise, actually. And that is the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you've gotten this far, remember to like, comment, subscribe. Remember to follow my, my new Instagram, Big Easy Easy. Remember to follow my TikTok, 
real and easy easy thank you so much to scentbird for being the sponsor of today's video really appreciate it and i will see you guys fairly soon for another book review bye